evening. How's your day? My day's been very cloudy. I think it's even been raining. Anyway. What have you got tonight? Hi, Victoria. What have we got tonight? We've got... Well, I was going to show you, go through the Chronicles of Olivia interview with um, CP and KP. Hi, Ellie. Right? And just by coincidence today, I came across another video. It's, I think I said, I'm going to put it on my Twitter account. Right, and hi SRB, I see my cougar is here, right, and I thought, oh my god, what a coincidence, I was going to go through that video tonight, but what I'm going to show you, it blew my mind when I was seeing it, and I'm sure it might blow some of yours. Right? And then you've got that interview with News Nation where Seth literally says law enforcement aren't doing anything. Right? And I believe he's right in what he says with the text messaging. Why did you send a text? Why not phone him? Right? But then again, if they've got nothing new to tell him, if they phone him, he's likely to go, oh, well, is that all you've got? And blow off at them. But they've got to be thick-skinned and understand where he's coming from, you know what I mean? He's a father whose son has gone missing. He's going to be upset. He's going to be angry. He's going to be all those, all these emotions that come with losing having a son that goes missing, a child that goes missing. So they've got to be thick-skinned enough to take all that. So doing a phone call wouldn't hurt. It shouldn't hurt. Right? I know if I had a child missing, all I got after law enforcement is a text message. I'd be telling them where to shove their text messages. Phone me. If you want to speak to me, phone me. You know what I mean? That's an easy way of getting out of any confrontation is by sending a text message. But then, I was watching the Pascal show. And he had an ex-FBI agent on there. She now does her own YouTube channel, right? And she's very, very good. And some of the answers she gives... Clears some things up. Not all things, but some things. Right? So, we're going to have a listen to that as well. I don't know what to show you first. The, the clip of KB on the Chronicles of Olivia. Or the News Nation. You know what? I'm going for the, the Chronicles of Olivia clip. Because that blew my mind when I saw it. And I'm good at picking up things normally, spotting things. But this is a body action and... Body reactions I don't normally pick up on. I pick up on words. Right? All right, I've just got to pause this, yeah. And it's titled... Katie Proudfoot tells the truth. The tale of the universal hanged guest gesture. Right? And um, it's. I was mind blown. It blew my mind, put that man. Because it is, it's a sort of hanged gesture. Everyone, I'm sure everyone is going to go, you're dead. You know, when you go, you're dead. Mm. 
and you use that hand gesture. Yeah? Well, watch this. Hold on. Let's get shared first. Yeah, we're going to go over that on this FSRB. It's so informative, that one is. But I just want to show you this one first. Oh my God, it's jaw dropping. Right, so bear with her. What she does is she goes through at normal speed, then she goes through at half speed, and then she slows it down even more. Right, so just did Katie Proudfoot let it slip and tell us all the truth, and we've all just missed it? Hmm, let's dig into this. Got my cats are fighting right by my feet. Right. Uh, <laughs> Pack it in, you two. Do I kill each other? Go in the hallway. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Regina and Friends Crime Chat. Once again, I'm your host, Regina, and we're going to have Sammy and Crystal up on panel here in just a minute. But I wanted to go through this and play this one time for you guys before I did. Um, I noticed something in the interview with Katie Proudfoot, and I'm not so sure that Katie Proudfoot didn't tell us all the truth unintentionally at one point, and we've all missed it. Okay, um, we're starting. This is the interview from Chronicles of Olivia. Shout out to Chronicles of Olivia. It says exclusive interview with Sebastian Rogers, mother and stepfather. If you guys would like to watch the full video, please go over there. Today, I'm only going to be sharing a small clip uh, for purposes um, of what I've noticed in this video real quick. I'm going to play it on regular speed first, and then I'll play it again um, at half speed. Make sure. It's on normal. Okay. Here we go. We can't find our son. And um, I like I jumped into my car and I drove around. I drove over by the school and he already like I, at this point. Did you guys just see that? Did you see it? I drove on I around did. the neighborhood. I drove around the school and he's already. And then watch, pay attention, you guys. I think that this is very important, and I want to know watch what you guys her think. hands. We're going to slow it down and play it again at half speed. Real quick, let me rewind it again. You too. Pay attention. We can't find our son. And um, I had, like, I jumped in my car, and I drove around the neighborhood and I drove over by the school and he's already like I, at this point like his did y'all see what she did with her hand hmm I don't know if I'm just like guessing at this or seeing things but I'm gonna get some opinion on this Hello, Sammy. Hello, Crystal. I saw it. Hello. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Did you guys see what I just played? I did. I did. You did. Right, I saw it. It's the hand gesture where she goes, she's using her hand to point like she goes for a car, she drives around the area, and then she goes towards the school, and he, wa he was... And as she brought her hand back, she brought it up to her neck, towards her neck, and did that hand gesture towards her neck. Like, finito, you're dead, you're gone, you're, you know what I mean? I don't know how many times I've done that when I was younger. When someone's really pissed me off and I've gone, oh, you're dead, you're fucking dead, and I've used that hand gesture. Meaning, you're done. So I'll play it again. And that that hand gesture, if if I'm not mistaken, whenever I'm telling someone, finished, done, finito, 
I'm making the hand gesture of my hand across my throat in a straight line. Even when I've had an argument with my husband, well, when he's alive, I just put my hand up, say, don't want to know. And if he carried on, I just use that hand signal across my throat. Finito, finished. Um, am I just seeing things or do you guys see what I'm seeing? I see what you're seeing. I think that her body is speaking volumes. Volumes. It's almost like she finished what she was saying with her hand to not let it slip out of her mouth. Did Katie tell us all the truth about what happened to Sebastian? He's already finito, finished with her hand. Let's let's do that one more time. I'm going to slow it down. Um, even further again real quick and let that play and watch what Katie Proudfoot does with her hand and tell me that's not the universal hand gesture for finish done finito and she's talking about Sebastian in this moment so I just can't help but think she it's it's almost like a, a Freudian slip of the hand if you will yeah. she's slowing up yeah. Watch the hand, she says, and he was already. He's already in the hand goes. Yes. Go back just a few more seconds. Close her hand after she said it. It's like she's her hand was typically like stroking her neck after she said it and after she did that hand gesture. Even though it was only slight, that hand gesture was only slight. Where if I do it, it's it's a flat hand and it's like Phew. it's there. It's not hands, fingers bent or anything. It's it's. The flat hand is out and it's across my throat. But it's, yes. And I say, is it time out gesture? It could be. Some use that as a time out. I don't. I use it as a finish it. Finito. It's finished. Um, no, I can show you that part. I can actually pull the video up and like, we can look through the whole of that video if you want. You know what I mean? But I'm not looking for uh, body signals. I'm, I was just listening to her words. And I picked up on that bit where she said, and we went round the school and he was, and she, she, she suddenly stopped what she was saying. To say and then said something else, but as she stopped, her hands, if you notice, her hand come up and went across uh, the neck. So, was she telling us in her hand signals, in her body language, the rest of this, rest of what she wanted to say? Because it was weird that she said, and he was gone, but I pulled the whole video up. You know what part of I meant, okay, you know what part I meant, then you, well, I don't have to play it. I can play. It is hard to hear it because it's slowed down, Victoria. Right? But I'll pull it up. Oh. I'll get it up on YouTube and we. I'll show it to myself on there. Oh. Chronicles of Olivia. Right, let's go down. Let's find it. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. 
Right, that's the intro, okay. I'm gonna get past the intro. Oh no. We don't need to go past the intro because it's in the intro, I think she does he. So no. Right, let's play this. Because I was gonna view this video tonight. And but then the Pascal show come on and that interview come on and I thought, ooh, what should I play? And I like the Pascal, so we are going to look at the Pascal, don't worry. It's funny like that. Can you recap the overall story of Sebastian's disappearance? Kind of walk through that day. Um, Sunday, the day before he went missing. Um, <coughs> we got up and, fun fact, I made breakfast that morning. <laughs> um, right, well, I, people used to say about me, I talk with my hands. No, my face does the talking. I don't need to use my hands very often anymore. I just use my face. You know what I mean? Give them that side look or eye roll or something like that. So, but I used to, when I'm, I, I still do, I suppose, when I'm trying to explain something, to, like I'm doing it now. <coughs> I'm actually sitting here using my hands. Like, when I'm trying to explain something to someone, I'll use my hands, and my hands are going constant. But if someone is talking and they say something that is peeing me off, <coughs> or something I don't believe because I know they're lying yeah. with the back teeth, I tend to sit on my hands because I'm likely to punch their lights out, and I'll use my face instead. My eye rolls, my side eye, everything. Um, <laughs> because you're not a suspect. <laughs> Hope to never be one either, yeah. So, I'd just like to say hello to everyone who's in the bushes and those on Twitter. Thank you for being here tonight. Please come and join in on the chat. We don't bite. Anyway, I'm going to play this and we'll go through this, okay? We had a good time. We were laughing. We were joking. I'll have to speed it up a little um, bit. He talked to family on the phone during breakfast to brag. Um, we went and picked up our niece. Yes, uh, yeah, I got a call and... See how she nudged him, tapped him then, looked at him and tapped him. You know, how would he you know? Okay, they've gone over this story time and time again now. Right. They've had plenty of time to perfect the story. And... So... But she's always looking at him now for that bit of moral support. I, am I saying this right? Am I getting this correct? Yes. Yes, we are very friendly here. Very friendly. Literally, I literally can't talk and stand or sit still. And I have nervous laughter. He oops at the most inconvenience necrolic <laughs> nervous laugh. La he whoops at the most inconvenient times. <laughs> well it can't be no worse than when I'll tell you this, and this is a true this is true. 
Now, I can't remember his funeral it was. I think it was my uncle's. Right, I'm not sure. But my nan came with us. So, myself, well, us, the seven kids in my family, we sat at the back of the church, right? And my mum and dad were sitting down the front. And we sat with my nan, right? And as we're sitting there, my nan, bless her heart, right? She passed, with, uh, she, she burped and passed wind at the same time. I'm sitting one side of that, my brother's sitting near that, and we both looked at each other, and my nan said, oops, it's coming out both ends here. Well, by then, me and my brother and everyone, all the other brothers and sisters were laughing, but trying not to laugh. So as we walked out the church, we've got tears rolling down our faces, literally in tears with laughter. But we couldn't make out, it was laughed at, we had, you know what I mean? And everyone thought we was really, really upset about this funeral. And it wasn't, it was because of my nan. It's because of what she said. And we're sitting there going, oh my God. And we just, we couldn't even burst out loud. We had to snigger, we had to snigger the laugh. So, um... New glasses. <laughs> yep. Honest, it was, it was the way she said it though, and she didn't say it like she went, oops, it's coming out both, at both ends. And me and my brother just sat there looking at each other. And But when she said, oops, it's coming out both ends, we just, that was it. That was it for us. And... Then everyone else in the row was saying, what's happening, what's happening? So Mark's passing it on his way. I'm passing it on to my other brothers and sisters, the, to the side of me. I'm not joking. We, in, we had tears rolling down our face. It was unbelievable. So that was inappropriate time. <laughs> That's an inappropriate time. But we got away with it. We got away with it. Anyway, let's continue. Yeah. Asked if I could go and pick her up, and I did. And so um, we went to that and we went to BJ's. Um, had a good time there. He ate a colossal popcorn. Um, came home to put at least 15 snacks. Um, we went to the bowling alley. And then from there, we went to dinner. Came home. Um, he took out the trash because that's his chore. He takes the can to the end of the driveway. Hmm. Um, I'm just dying. Nine o'clock. Told him to go to bed. He's come out of his room where he was playing. He said, "All right, good night, Mama. Good night, puppies. I love you." He went to bed. Um, he was doing something in his room because about an hour later, I heard some noise and I was like, "I don't care what you're doing in there, but go to sleep." And um, about midnight, I got up and I went to bed. And um, Six o'clock, I went to wake him up for school Monday morning. Notice how she didn't mention the thug in this interview. She just said, I don't know what you're doing in there, but go to sleep. She didn't mention any thug in this interview. Why? And that's when he went here. What was going through your mind at that point? Like, what were the feelings that you were feeling? to censor myself. Holy freaking crap, this can't be happening. Where is my kid? Choice words were used. Um, like, you know, where the F is he? Um, I had called, I looked for the house for him. It was typical for him to get up and come and rummage for snacks and things like that. And he likes to dip behind the, you know, walls and watch, you know, and, um, and then he comes out after I come back and he likes to scare me. <laughs> but um, after I looked, and I mean, mind you, all, all this took place in like one minute flat. But um, I didn't see him in his room. I looked all over. I ran through the whole house. I looked out all his windows and I was like hollering his name. And um, I picked up the phone and I called my husband and I said, um, I can't find him. And he said, what do you mean? I said, he's not in his effing house. I can't find our son. And um, I like, I jumped in my car and I drove around the neighborhood and I drove over by the school. And he's already like, I, at this point, I was like hysterical and I was crying, I was screaming. And um, 
he was like, um, uh, three way, he three wayed law enforcement and um, was telling them, like, our son is missing and we don't know what's going on. And he, like, he was like, go back to the house, they're on their way. And they ran back, well, drove back to the house. And, um, one days later, they were yeah, that cough. That cough was his way of saying, get back on track. It's a little signal if he says anything out of order. If they're closing off, she elbow him. If not, she taps him to this, on the leg, to the side. So if she's closing off, she'll give him the little note of the elbow or tap to the leg. His signal is a cough. Yes. Hi, Tracy. Right. So you missed the one bit at the beginning. I'm gonna. I'll do it on this one actually. I'm gonna show you some Tracy on here, which I showed you in every video before. But I'll show it on here. Okay. And you watch in a minute when I get there. Law enforcement and uh, was telling them, like, our son is missing and we don't know what's going on. And he, like, he was like, go back to the house. They're on their way. And they ran back, well, drove back to the house. And, um, I don't know, we've gone past it, haven't we? And, um, six o'clock, I'm going to wake him up for school Monday morning. And that's when he went here. What was going through your mind at that point? Like, what were the feelings that you were feeling? to censor myself. Holy freaking crap, this can't be happening. Where is my kid? Choice words were used. Um, like, you know, where the F is he? You know. Um, I had called my, I had looked through the house for him because it was typical for him to get up and come and rummage for snacks and things like that. And he likes to dip behind the, you know, walls and watch, you know, and, um, and then he comes out after I come back and he likes to scare me. <laughs> but um, after I looked, and I mean, mind you, all of this took place in like one minute flat. But um, I didn't see him in his room. I looked all over. I ran through the whole house. I looked out all the doors and windows and I was like hollering his name. And um, I picked up the phone and I called my husband and I said, um, I can't find him. And he said, what do you mean? I said, he's not in his effing house. I can't find our son. And um, I had like, I jumped in my car and I drove around the neighborhood and I drove over by the school and he'd already. Right. Now I try to, I'm going to slow it down because we've seen Another video of this, but I'm going to do it on mine because I've got this video up. Watch her hands. Right? Watch her hands. So, um, I can't find him. And he said, what do you mean? I said, he's not in this up and how I'm screaming. And, uh, <laughs> oh no, we've gone past it. Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. All the doors and windows, and I was like, hollering his name. And, um, I picked up the phone and called my husband, and I said, um, I can't find him. And he said, What do you mean? If he's not in this effing house, I can't find our son. And um, I'd like, I jumped in my car and I drove around the neighborhood and I drove over by the school. And he's already. Did you see her hang thing, Tracy? I'd like, I jumped in my car and I drove around the neighborhood and I drove over by the school and he's already. When she said he's already, she did the hand signal across her, across her neck, across her throat, as to say, finished, finito, gone. Like, I, at this point, I was, like, hysterical, and I was... Right. 
So we'd already watched that, but I just thought I'd show it again for Tracy because she wasn't here. One minute flat, yeah. Who remember? I wouldn't even be able to put a time on anything that I've done. And the fact that she said she went to check the kitchen, she has to come through the kitchen to get to his room. Maybe the thought was the door shutting. Hmm. But what about? Apparently, someone got on a, one of their security cameras or something. The bedroom light was on and off, coming on and off. So, I'm going to speed it back up to normal speed now. Well, I did have it a bit... Oh, sorry, take that off. I did have it out a bit faster, didn't I? Oh, yeah, I had it out. Up to there, okay? What are your theories? Like... I'm sure your mind has thought of every possible thing that could have happened, but is there any theory that you can talk about that you think? What I can tell you is with all law enforcement, with everybody that's involved, there's nothing that's been eliminated. Everything is on the table. Everything is being looked at from every possible aspect. You can see from there, she is looking at that photo of Sebastian on the table. You can see there, she is looking at that photo. So she is probably right when she said the reason she don't look at the um, person who's doing the interview is because she's looking at a photo. Because there is a photo on the table, just at the bottom of your, uh, just out of screen, you can see it. Um, Everything from he got out and walked away and was outside of the search radius before we started searching to the worst. Yeah. And... And that's currently where we're at. I mean, it is. Yeah. Really trying not to go down that road because. Hi, Kim. When we're going to find him. I've been staying with Oh, dumb. Assumptions oh, cause issue. Been saying this since the first day I seen the interview with Olivia. That's why she's not interviewing anymore. Hopefully, law enforcement is watching everything she's doing. She did one more interview after this, and that was with that other show where but she only it was only for about three or four minutes and she had probably been told the questions beforehand that was going to be asked so she knew how to answer them right um but that was the only interview if you notice chris was not on the only interview and why is that Oh, yes, it was a male interviewer, not a woman interviewer. And he says, he'll turn around and say, I do do interviews with men. No, you don't, CP, you don't. Chris, okay, to yours, you don't. A toy crane. I think on the table, a toy crane, was he operating a crane at 5 a.m.? Well, this is a big source of, was he there at 5.15 a.m. or wasn't he? Because I've just heard, was it this morning or something, in a comment someone put up, I, I, I can't verify whether he was or not. But apparently the gates don't open till about 6.30. Right? 6 o'clock, 6.30. But why would you go to work that flipping early if you're not on, if you don't start till 7? I know I wouldn't be. I know when I was at work, if I was in a workplace, like a lot of my work was outdoor, uh, going from one house to another, right, which I prefer that rather than being stuck in one place. But when I was in a uh, one place, I'd get there for about like, 15 minutes earlier so I could get a cup of coffee or something before starting. But I wouldn't st be there, what, 45, 46, an hour and 45 minutes earlier. 
I'm not getting paid for that time, so why would you go that early? And then he made out that he had to wait for someone to take him off the crane. And he didn't go off the crane till half one. No, 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 no. He got off that crane between 10 and 11 in the morning because one of his colleagues had put a complaint in about him, right, about his attitude and everything. So they got him off that crane between 10 and 11 in the morning. And then he still didn't come home, get home to about half one. 11 to 12, 12 to 1. Yeah, I suppose that's about right, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12. Yeah, if he got off that crane about 10, it'd be about three, three and a half hours. But why would you go to work knowing your stepson was missing? Apparently, the sunrise that time was round about 6.30ish, 6.15, 6.30. I oh, know, it's a climb up that, you, it wouldn't take you that long to climb up there, right? So, but he went to work knowing his stepson was missing. Hold on, he got that phone call at six, say, ten, five past, ten past six. He could have said, right, phone the police, I'll be there straight away as soon as I can, right? I would have then gone to my manager and gone, look, I've got to leave. Because this would have been before he would have got up on that crane. I've got to leave. There's an emergency at home. I'll fill, I'll fill you in later. Right? And I'd have left. So I'd have been off that site by what? Quarter past 20 past six. But no, he goes to work. And he did like four hours work. Three to four hours work before he actually gets off. Would he have actually come home then if he hadn't been kicked off this off the crane? If it wasn't for his manager, yeah, or whatever, saying, Well, right, you're off the crane, get off. Would he have come home? That's my question. Nope, he wouldn't. Oh, God, I've got my. I've gone back down to there. Nothing that's been eliminated. Everything is on the table. Everything is being looked at from every possible aspect. Um, Everything from he got out and walked away and was outside of the search radius before we started searching to the worst. Yeah. And, and that's currently where we're at. I mean, it's... Yeah. Really trying not to go down that road because well, we're going to find him. Speculating causes problems, assumptions cause issues, and based on facts of what everybody knows, right now, there's nothing, and everything is still on the table to be looked at. We just know he's out there somewhere. One other question I have is, recently, Channel 5 in Nashville, they had security footage that showed two flashlights um, the night he disappeared. Is there anything... Um, that you think about this video or sure so m cause hello there's a lot of speculation about that video that are floating on the internet okay and that is exactly what it is is it speculation so to have you know, to hear you an official statement on it is tbi newslink has released a statement from law enforcement between local law enforcement state law enforcement some federal law enforcement and they have analyzed that video so many times over that Everything that everybody is trying to assume is a flashlight. I'm, I hate to say this. It's not. As much as we would love it to be one, it's not. Um, I'm not going to go into details as far as where that video is shot from. But I can tell you, as the parents, we have seen the video firsthand from law enforcement. We know exactly where it was taken from. And nothing that is being assumed right now is actually true about that video, unfortunately. And anything about other, any other videos or anything like that, please refer to the TBI news link that they have out there. They have updated Amber Alert stuff, and it will give you the most up to date information that all in, uh, law enforcement. Does anyone has, else think that Kai is acting strange in this what? Yes. And how they're looking at things. And if there's any new video, forward it to them. Please. 
Bị nghe quá à. Um, I think she's on medication. I really think she's been given some medication from the doctor. Because she, she seems her life. Oh, I can't be bothered with this. I just want to go to sleep. You know what I mean? She's too calm. If you know, way too calm. Now they do. I know doctors do give medication to parents in this situation that are having so like so much panic attacks or everything. They do give them medication to keep them calm. Yeah, she's very slow. So, um, I think she's on medication. Anyway, let's go a bit more. But it's just really like a game changer. Um, we're working on Riley's strain and trying to find like if someone missed one on a corner or something. No, I'm sorry, I'm not listening to that because that's got nothing to do with this case, sorry. Call 911, run out to the street, go in public, anything. The signs that we've been blessed to have family, friends, and even some in the community that have been helping us, but we've been out spreading those as far as we can, even over state lines, um, trying to get awareness because you know, not everybody knows that he's missing and there's a chance that if someone can see him and not even realize who he is. So we want to get his face out there because we want him home. Surprisingly, even locally, there are some folks that... I would say start the search on the way from your house to Clarksville. That's where I would be heading. I don't even know what's going on. and It's kind of like a shocker. Like, how do you not know? You know, it, it's, it is amazing because in the past couple of weeks, you've got two cases, a 15 year old boy that has vanished without a trace. You've got a 20. Because in that first interview she did when she was rocking, right, I don't think she was on, if she was on medication, it hadn't fully kicked in. And as I said, I think she was sitting there rocking because as I've said many times before, there's been cases where, I've had to sit on my hands many, many times, right? Because I've been told something like a secret and I can't say anything to anyone. And then this person is talking about this so-called thing that, that she'd love to do. And I'm thinking, hmm, -hmm I know the truth. I know what's going to happen, but I can't say nothing. And I'm sitting there so that my hands won't give me away by going, doing all these hand gestures when I do talk. I sit on my hands so I can't give my hands, my hands won't give away. And I tend to keep my mouth shut, but now my face tends to give me away because I do eye rolls and that side look and all this like and this, and the deep sigh like, oh God, I just want to tell them. And I sit there rocking. Now that's a big telltale sign of me. If I, if anyone in my family ever sees me sitting there rocking while they're talking about something, it's because I know something. <laughs> right? So I'm giving all my secrets to right, my family. Six foot four or seven uh, college kid from Missouri who has vanished without a trace. That That's a huge significance here that it's like, wow. How? <laughs> so. That's scary. Yeah. And unfortunately, the, the college kid is from Missouri. Thank you. Yeah, Missouri. Because I can only imagine really what his family is. Where that time and possibly not medicated. You know, a lot. yes. Do you guys receive hate that, on the internet? Yes. And it's ongoing. It's every single day. Um, yeah. People are people. And they have their opinions. Not being triggered. Um, yeah. Everybody is a form their idea of what's going on and who's guilty and who's not guilty because they want to know, or they feel they need to know. There's a difference. Unfortunately, what I will tell you is that 
when you're the family in this position and you're working. No, CP. CP, get this right. We're not saying you're guilty. We're saying you're acting guilty. Your actions are speaking louder than words. And your actions are telling us you're guilty. So you're, it's not we're saying you're guilty. Your actions are saying you're guilty. Right? And so it's we only go by what we see and hear. Right? Well, 99% of us on YouTube who do true crime do. There's that 1% that twists the narrative. Right? I'm not that 1%. I'm that 99% that do not twist the narrative. And I go by what they say, more by what they say than what they do. Because I miss that hand gesture across the neck. I missed that because I wasn't looking for body movements or hand gestures. I was listening to the words and that I did pick up on the fact that she said, and when got well, driving around the school and he was, and she stopped suddenly, I picked up on that. I didn't pick up on the hand gesture. Some people do. Some people don't. But we don't change it to fit a narrative. We there are some that do, and those ones I will not watch. I've seen them come up with their trigger, um, not trigger, uh, the clickbait titles, and I'm thinking, yep, and I swipe because I watch it on my TV, and I'm swiping past them. And they could be channels that I normally I would have watched, because of, but because of their clickbait titles, I'm not watching them. working with law enforcement and everything's going the way it goes, people automatically assume this parent or that parent. And in this situation, I can promise you, every single parent has been vetted. I can't go into details, but I can tell you we have been vetted and we have been cleared um, of all possibility of wrongdoing. Exactly. And play. There's nothing to that. Um, Thank you. We've heard all kinds of stories. Thank you for that. I just don't even go online anymore at this point. I, on the other hand, I do go on and I do talk to these folks and I, I want them to understand they have this formulated opinion. But I will state, and I've said it, I, if my channel, if I had a big platform, right, and I was used to interviewing people or I had a list of questions I could ask them beforehand and I had this big panel all right, and someone like this family, right? I'd have Katie on my panel. But I'm sorry, I'm not having him on there. No way. No. That is why, like, the first time they wanted to do the Nancy Grace interview, they said no. Because they didn't want him. They just wanted Katie. And they said no, because he wasn't involved. Now, I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. I'm not having a narcissistic file piece of whatever on my channel. Not doing it. I could have the mother, because she's the mother of the missing child. I could have the father, Seth, because he's the father of the missing child. You're nothing. You're just this step father. And after what I've heard, I won't even call you that, give you that title. On who we are, not who we truly are. They've never met us. We've never been, we've never crossed paths with some of these folks. But I have told them all online, if you want to know, just ask me. I'll answer your questions to the best of what I can. I can there are some things that I cannot give you Chris, you don't answer the question and she has dictated that we you dance around the question but I will you don't actually you. answer questions you dance direct. around I am brash but I'm very respectful so if you have questions ask I'll give you a not hand. respectful 
just be respectful, please. And keep in mind, there's three parents and there's thousands and millions of people out there that may have a question. I am, we are trying to get to them, I promise you. How has your guys' life been affected by that? Like, uh, I know it's a broad question, but what's, like, when you wake up in the morning, what's... I feel disheartened, deflated with so many cre 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 hatred towards this father who is broken. Do you mean Seth? Yeah. Yeah, he's broken. And they take, you know what they're doing? It's because of Tony. Why? It's because of Tony. Tony Mathis. They're taking it out on him now because of Tony Mathis. I'm sorry. It's got nothing to do with us who he has helping him. Yeah. It's got nothing to do who Seth has to help with him. If you don't like him, you don't like him, fine. But don't drag Seth th through the dirt for that. Right? I was okay with Tony, but the past few weeks when I've seen him coming out with some of this stupid information, and instead of vetting it and getting it cleared first by law enforcement or TBI, he's putting it out there on TikTok. It's, it's not right. And people are saying today, it's doing it to get his followers up. Well, I'm subscribed. I've got, I'm following that channel. But because I keep missing the interviews, I'm going to unfollow. I'm not following a channel where I can't see the live interviews. You know what I mean? Because of the time he does them, I'm in bed. So what's the point of me following a channel I can't follow, I can't watch any of the interviews on? So I'm, I'm going to unfollow. Actually, I'll do that later when I finish here. I might write that down, jog it in my memory. Unfollow. Tony. TikTok. Right? I have to write things down, otherwise I forget. And so, but you shouldn't drag the father through this. You shouldn't. Yeah, Tony does need to go because he's causing a lot of the drama. And I'm not going to even repeat what I heard today on one YouTube channel. I'm not going to repeat what he said, because I, I don't think it's true. Right? And even the host himself didn't think it was true. You know what I mean? I could see where he's coming from, but I don't think it's true. What's it just like? <laughs> Think of it like this. You wake up every morning and your routine is what it is and you know it, right? Now I wake up when this happens and you can't figure out what to do. You struggle. Definitely not need a glass. On trying to get out of the bed to deal and face everybody's negativity you know they're still they working on getting the money to get a truck fixed so she can come up to do this we have a bedroom that's empty that is never normally ever empty except for when he's with his dad every other weekend so now we have a child that's missing so there's no words to, to describe it but i can just tell you it's like you get up and now you don't know what to do sebastian's parents also talked about how his actions and behaviors could be different or how he would respond in a new environment. Well, that's, that's kind of tricky because <laughs> Sebastian hasn't been on his medication in 20 days. So he is rambunctious. He, he's going to be hungry. He will, he, he turns into a bottomless pit. I mean, he, he's your teen. Oh, done. Oh, done. Sorry, I'm back. Had sirens go screeching by and had to listen to Scanner. Okay, what was happening? Was there shooting? <laughs> Was it just a domestic? 
God, I have sirens going daily where I live, daily. Either ambulances, fire, yeah, fire, police. And I remember once where I live, there's two blocks, two tower blocks, right? And I was just moving into my one flat, into the flat I'm in now. And some guys come to, I think they come to fit, fit my cooker. And I'm waiting there and I'm looking out the window. And the guy's come up to me and he's talking to me and he's looking out the window and saying, oh, yes, there's all police down there. I went, what do you mean? So, no, I wasn't at the window at the time. I was sitting down. I said, what do you mean? There's all police out there. And um, so I've shot up to my window. Apparently, some guy was going around with a machete knife. I went, are you serious? My daughter-in-law and grandkids are coming now. They've got to walk past all that. Right? And um, I'm not joking. You're seeing I'm coming around with the uh, with the guns, everything. I thought, this is serious. They've got the police have got their firearms out here. And they don't do that in the UK, in Scotland or the UK. Unless it's serious. I think, oh my God, my daughter knows coming through all this. And the amount of times I've had fire engines at either this block, at my at the other block where I used to live, across just from me, I used to live in the, the other block. I was coming home from my sons and I couldn't get in because there'd been a fire on one of the floors, so they shut off the lifts straight away. The lifts are blocked. So I couldn't get in. I know I only had to go up four floors, but I had like five, six bags. I thought, I'm not going to carry these up four, four, four floors. So they tell, after they got it all cleared, and I didn't have a coat with me, right, I just had a little jacket, so it was cold as well. I go, I just want to get in, I just want a coffee. Fuck's sake, I'm thinking, let me in my flat. But the wooden little sink, and there's fire engines, ambulances, police. And it's always the same round this block. Both blocks, there's always fire engines and police. Next time the fire engines are here, I'll try and get on video, but nine times out of ten, I don't hear them. I really don't. Yeah, just give me my coffee, I just want a coffee. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've gone over an hour without a coffee. I need a coffee. <laughs> but no, um, there's always fire engines around these two blocks. Always. So, but next time we have anything exciting like that, I'll actually, I won't look out the window. What I do, I put my phone out the window and I put it on video record. And I look at my phone because I won't look out the window because I don't like heights. Right, so I'm looking out through my phone, through the camera on the phone. I don't <laughs> like heights and I don't like lifts. Um, and I've got both. On the spectrum, yes. But not one autistic child in this world is like another one. What we can tell you is he's, he's smart. He can be goofy. Um, he kind of has issues with personal space. He hasn't mastered he can be a, <laughs> up in your face kind of kid. He's <laughs> he can be aggressive if he's upset. Yeah. He's emotional. He's a teenager. He's got he doesn't like punch and hit and throw, but he no. gets really like aggressive stance or like clipped where he just won't talk to you. Or... I leave literally, well, 10 minutes at the most by car from the hospital. And I leave the rest of news fire station from me. Beyond the, what, about 10 minutes from here, fire station. I think it's about 10 minutes, if that. If they come along the highway, uh, the dual carriageway, it's about five minutes. But I don't know where the nearest fire station, that's bad. I know where there is a fire station, but I don't know if that's the nearest one. 
because they all seem to come from the direction of the city centre. So there must be a fire station made by the city centre somewhere. <laughs> but I'm not far from the amb from the hospital, and that's why I hear a lot of police and the ambulances and everything round here. Right. Um, you know, if he's really upset, he like growls. Yeah. He... <sighs> yes. Sheriff, sure, look. He's vigilant. You know, we don't expect everybody to stop what they do and spend every waking minute. But you would be surprised on how easily people are complacent and not realize certain things. We're all guilty because we're all human. We all live a daily life. But sometimes just being a little bit extra vigilant. Aware of your surroundings in case there's something suspicious. You never know. But don't ever stop is all we ask. Please keep looking, keep searching. Um, anything, reach out. You know, doesn't matter. So why have you got your little loony tunes going around threatening searchers? And don't tell us tell us it isn't you, CP. Who else would want the searchers to stop? Hmm? Who else? There's no one else would even think of well, we're not gonna look for that little boy, we'll just stop the searches. Who else? He's going around threatening people, CP. Tell us that. Hmm? Who else has gone around and slashing tyres, CP? Tell us that. When there was a car spotted going past, very oh, well, similar yeah, to yeah. your mother's. Or Katie's, one of the two. I'd say your mother's because yeah. Katie's in hiding. Keep his story in the spotlight and all it takes is for one person to see something or know something and that's just that one clue the old saying see something say something and a few others but we're working with everyone we can and take in like some people have been kind and reached out with resources that i didn't know were out there and i've reached out to all of them um truckers against trafficking we reached out to them just in case have you reached out to CUE organization or foundation who helps with, who've got all the um, resources to help look for a missing child? Have you? Because we know law enforcement haven't, not yet. Biker world, that's one thing everybody that's has in common is their love for a child and they can't stand to see children missing, hurt. It doesn't matter who it is. It of what group it is that's one commonality between every group and that's why as a, as a part of being in that world we go and we utilize our brothers and sisters yep. to help spread that word you'd be surprised on how easy it is to spot somebody this this the bike so um how can people help every i mean this community i'm gonna tell you right now i've never heard anything like that in uh, all the cases i've followed some people in other states uh reach out either through social media uh in person but everybody is searching and they've looked uh they're constantly looking they're constantly giving us ideas hey check this what about this all of that is great um support anything that could potentially even if it's little it doesn't matter what it is however Hold on, what, what we that? can ask is that instead of people assuming and trying right what I probably regret saying this but what if some or tbi are covering up something and placing all these individuals as distraction hmm that would be a big cover up what could that be covering up you know what I mean? Why would I try these distractions? What they, what do they not want these searchers to know? And I'll tell you one who will find. If any searcher is going to find this boy, I know. You know, because TBI, uh, FBI have just done a big uh, thing with the trafficking. I've just found 11 children or something, or more. So it's not the FBI, but TBI, 
Hmm. Something I can see, definitely. But I wouldn't say TBI, but something I uh, shaves off, it's just... They're getting paid off. I don't care what anyone tells me. So... But it's like, I just find it weird that when anyone, they can go out for one or two, three or four, two weekends, say, so four days. Then after that, they get threats. Are they getting close to something? Now, to me, I'd be going, you know what? The more they're threatening me, the more it shows me I'm hitting, going the right direction. I'm getting somewhere close where they don't want me to go. So, that's why Tian doesn't tell anyone where she goes on her searches, right? And I think that day with her tyres, I think it's just pure luck that they found her seeing her car parked up. You know what I mean? Unless she was being followed, but... Yeah. So scary how bad the traffickers have picked up. Yes, it is. It's like I was going through the missing children page for the UK, for London, just in London. And I'm thinking, I think a lot of these are being used for trafficking. I really do. And you know how they do it over here? And when my grandkids get older, I'll be teaching them this. There was a big trafficking ring going on in the UK, and it went to court. And um, what it was, you know, we get these um, kebab shops and chips, fish and chips and kebabs and all that lot. And these young kids would hang around there and they'd go in and they'd buy a kebab or buy a portion of chips. But then they'd say, that's free to you. You don't have to pay. So what young child is not going to go, oh, wow, thank you, right, and walk away? And that happens once or twice, maybe three times. But then they say, hold on, we've gave you three, uh, we've gave you three Three meals. You owe us. Right? So then they go, or they invite them into the back room. Right? Why don't you come in the back room, have a drink, have a kind of pop and some chips in there with us? And they get them hooked so bad that they threaten their families, the mothers, the fathers, the uncles, the aunts, the grandparents. And these girls are petrified and they're being taken all across the UK. Different towns and different places all across the UK. And then being brought back early hours in the morning or being brought back the next day. And when the parents try and do anything, they're getting threatened and the police won't listen to them. Right? But it stuck. It came out that it did go. They did manage to get this one group, and there's something like I can't remember how many there was now. They got sentenced, but they are supposed to be deported as well after their sentence finishes. But I doubt that will happen. I doubt it very much. Right, but these girl, children, these girls now are all grown up. Right. Some of them have even had babies by them, by their traffickers. You know what I mean? It's horrendous. And that's how easy they do it. They give them a free meal. And they do that a few times and they invite them into the back of the shop where they sit and talk and have a laugh and joke, get all friendly with them. And then they pull on the um, 
Oh, you're a pretty, you are. I just found your lemon tea out. Yeah, in Knoxville. It was a TBI. Its name was Operation Rocky Top. This reminds me of the movie The Tall Men, just throwing this out there, like undercover, off record. Hmm. Yeah, and there's more to come. There's more to come from what they're saying. Those children are going to need psychological help and support for a long time. It is. Now you look at Sebastian. I was going to mention bring this up as well, right? Because that interview is finished now, right? Just say he did. Say his mum put him outside the house on the night time because he wasn't settling down, right? Or he's being a bit cheeky. Right? And she put him outside that house on the night time with no shoes as our punishment because she knows he don't like going outside with no shoes. What if over the past few weeks beforehand, when he's gone on his little walkabouts before, because a neighbour in that other housing where the construction is going on said in that police dispatch call, that they have seen him in the area, but not that day. So he used to go around that area. He knew how to get to Calvers, the, whatever, the ice cream place or whatever it is, right? What's saying when his, when his mum's put him outside before? He's gone off on his little walkabouts, right? Or he's just going off on his own, on little walkabouts. I don't think this is the first time he's rang off. If he has rang off, I don't think it's the first time. And while he's out and about, he's met someone, right? And they've started talking to him. Yeah. Glad you caught it in time. You have to watch what sides they're on and who they're talking to. Hi, Robin. Um, the FBI are not going to come in on this case. Not personally take over. I'll be gobsmacked if they do. I did sign the petition, but I don't think they will. Yeah, I think... If she did put him outside as a punishment, he's probably wounded up. He's probably made a friend who his parent and mum doesn't know about when he's been out and about before, right? So how do we know if she's put him outside just for, I'll go to my friend's house, all right? He, he knows where he lives and he's gone there. He could be very nearby. He could be very nearby. Hi, MG. Hope you're feeling a little bit more calmer. <laughs> I don't think, personally, I don't think he did, but I'm just looking at other options, right? Because there's no way... Unless someone's got him and they've got him hidden somewhere, right? He's not going... I'm sorry, Seth, if you ever hear this video. I am so sorry. But I think this is a recovery. Unless someone has got him, this is a recovery. But saying that, there was a case, and we'll hear about it on Pascal's show in a minute, where an autistic lad, it was 15, 17, when he walked away, he went for walkabout. And they found him, was it three, four years later? Literally in the area where he lived, living homeless, he was homeless, and they found him sitting outside the store. So 
anything is possible at the moment. There's no proof that anything bad has happened that we know of. There's no, only little, like the, the words they use or the hand gestures that we've just shown you today, things like that. That will only come into place if they find him on alive. Right? All that information we are seeing and we're collating together, right? And all the red flags, they will only come into place if if and when Sebastian is ever found on alive. Yes, he did hide under the car. You know what I mean? Why would you why would a child hide under a car? So No, it wasn't I didn't think it was dates away. I thought it was in the same place where he lived. Anyway, you'll hear the name in that Pascal show which we're gonna put on in a minute. So, let's pull up the Pascal show, which I've got on my Facebook page. Right. Oh, come on. Come on. Sorry, I realised it's the interview with the News Nation. Let's go, MJ. Not that I know, like Necro. Hold on, hold on. What are you going on about, MG? T Rev was texting with Seth's girlfriend, allegedly. I'd say BS. Didn't know Seth had a girlfriend. You know what I mean? I think she retired. I think she retired because, to be honest with you, I, you, that isn't a sort of job that you could do for like 20, 30, 40 years. You know what I mean? It isn't. 
It would take your time to drink or something. It really would. So it's scrolling through the groups. I don't know the big deal. I just saw it. It shook my head. Nah. Give me receipts. Give me proof. Aye. Well, they are all saying two rivers living in Seth's apartment, so. It's, I tell you what, they're attacking T Rev. Tell you what. Right? It's because he's friends with Seth. Right? Now, I bet you, like, if I was to be on the phone, have Seth's phone number on my phone and be able to phone him and talk to him daily, Right, people found out I was able to do that. They'd have a go at me. You know what I mean? So, if anyone who's in contact with Seth, they are trying to drag through the dirt. And I don't believe that for one minute. Right, they tried to make out something, something wrong. You know what I mean? T Rev needs to go too. No, T Rev is good. I watch him every morning. <coughs> you only catch the circus updates, yeah. They're just looking for something. They're picking up on any little thing they hear. Just to get a story out there, you know what I mean? And it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I say BS on that. She's so young though, I don't think she's retired. Perhaps she gave it up because she has got a family now. Because in the interview here, she says, I've got to go now, I've got to pick my, do my child up from school. Perhaps she gave up because of her starting a family. Some do that. Because they want to be there for the child rather than be flying off here and flying off there. Because they could be anywhere. You know what I mean? There is a little... Oh, I'm gone. There is allegedly proof, screenshot, but I don't know, believe anything unless I see it happen in real life in my own eyes. Hold on, hold on. Was on a YouTube channel today because there's a woman got a YouTube channel, right? And I heard it was T Rev's ex girlfriend, and she was pulling up receipts about whatever. And I, I just switched it off. I thought, I don't want to hear this. This is Sarah Grapes now. I'm sorry, this is Sarah Grapes, and I don't want really to know about that. It's got nothing to do with Sebastian. So how is this helping Sebastian? It's not. She did say some of those cases cold, but because law enforcement isn't looking for her. Oh, you mean Summer's case is cold? Yeah, Summer's case is cold. Yeah. If I live in your home, I'm going to have to have your phone number. Hmm. He's not... I don't think he's in Seth's house. Yeah, these channels are getting ridiculous. As I said, because someone said he was living in the basement, they picked up on that and gone off with these ludicrous things. Right? Well, he did have to leave leave where he was before because he had nowhere to live. So perhaps he is living in Seth's house. No, he's, in, he's not in Clarksville. He's not living in Clarksville. As far as I know, he's not in Clarksville.
He won't say where he is, which I don't blame him. Lord, the daughter calling, I'll be back. Oh, just like my daughter when she phones. But if they're not doing anything against the YouTube regulations, then YouTube won't do nothing. Right, so... <coughs> T-Rev, I love T-Rev 757. He's lovely. And he keeps it real. He has said today, if this drama overtakes the case, if everything is just based on drama, then he will back away. He will back away from me. But he don't want to. Yes, but you see, T-Rev also has the music channel, his music, which he writes and sing, sings himself. So where where's the best place to be for music? Nashville. But even so, even if he is living with Seth until he finds somewhere else, what's it to do with us? It's got nothing to do with us. For Christ's sake. T Rev would be a calming influence on Seth if he is living with him for a short time. That's all I will say. It'll be the calming influence on Seth. But this this has to stop all this twisting of a nap. Like, you can say a sentence and not twist it and twist it. So, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And it's those that are making the money. P. Diddy. You're going down, big boy. <laughs> right, so it's just it's just so annoying. Anyway, we're gonna jump a bit because I wanna get to this interview thing. Could be. I don't think they will leave that. It won't win. Evil will never win.
I just thought of something. If Katie put him outside with no shoes, right? What if he did wander off? What if he did go to this? If he had made a friend, I'm sorry if she can't hear it. I don't know why. I can't turn it up anymore, Necro. Right, I'll see what I can do. Hold on. The volume is up as high as I could get it there. Let's see. Uh, oh, sound. Uh, uh, it's up, volume is up. Hold on. That's up. I can't understand why you're not hearing this when the other video you did. Right. Tell me now if you hear it. Oh, Christ, I don't know what else I to do. That's strange because you heard the other videos. It's not, is it, no, it's not muted. It's not muted. It's not muted on my end. No, it's not muted. I'll tell you what, I'll see if I can go out of this and then come back in and see what happens, okay? Uh, stop screen. I'll come back into it, hold on. Uh. Sorry. Oh. Uh, um, I'm trying to sort this out. Oh, God. In a nearby <coughs> waterway. Uh, after some days, uh, but we're not seeing that here from the standpoint of we have absolutely no proof of life and we have, have absolutely no proof of death. He was never seen 
past wow. the 25th. And when you look at that, it's very possible, and law enforcement has been clear, that there are no signs of foul play. My question, Good. though, is, Pascal, did they do the proper investigation within the house in terms of did they utilize luminol? Um, was that utilized at all? Any chemicals to determine substances uh, in and around that house? I don't know the answer to that question. I have to just assume or hope that law enforcement did the proper protocols in their search. No doubt. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things... I I am kind of curious about, though, um, because, you know, I haven't had anybody on that's part of law enforcement or, you know, has seen investigations into a, a potential crime scene or to a scene at all. So I am happy to, that you're here to kind of break some of these things down for me and hopefully for the rest of the fam that's watching the show. One of the things I'm kind of curious about is, uh, OK, he goes missing, right? He's reported missing. People come in, law enforcement of all kinds, dogs of all kinds come in, sniffing around, et cetera. Why wasn't that house just secured? Why wasn't it just shut down and saying, hey, no one in, no one out of this house? Even if they don't look at it as a crime scene, this is the last place that he was allegedly alive. So they just kind of, I don't conceal this house so that there isn't any manipulation, there isn't any any anything to kind of tarnish any potential. That's what I don't understand. It's like the Summer Moon case, right? They took it that even though the care team and TBI and law enforcement all said there was no signs of abduction, right? They didn't say to the family, look, you need to find somewhere else to live for the time being. Put, we'll put you up in a motel somewhere or something, anything. But we need you off this property so we can do a proper search. We can't do it while you and your husband and your other three kids are still here. We can't do that. If four forensics this weren't done on day one, that's no good for case. No, it has to be done on day one. Right? And I think even if they've got, look, say they've got washing in a washing machine, right, but hasn't gone through the wash yet, take it out, bag it up. As I've said before, uh, there was a, an ex-law police officer who said whenever he went to a home, whether it involved, whether they said it was just a missing child case, how he looked at it, he'd look at it like, first, right, we need you out of this home. We need to do a thorough check. So they'd move the family out. They'd go through it and look at it as though, has something happened in this house? Right? Get it all checked off. Once that's all come back clean, then they go, okay, could he have been kidnapped? So then they go through that. And once they've kicked off all that, then they go, okay, let's look at it. Here's a runaway. Once they've got those two major ones, he, anything could have happened maybe, or he's been kidnapped, struck, cleared, they can then look at it as a missing child. But they didn't. They looked at this as a runaway from day one. But apparently, by 72 hours, they did a full 180 on the case. They wasn't looking at it as a runaway or a missing child. Right? So what happened on the Wednesday for them to change their minds? Right? And it's so, I can't figure out what could have happened. I did think of something earlier, and I, sh I should have my book by me at all times. But I didn't. And I thought of something, and now it's going out of my head, and I don't, can't remember what it was. But they should treat it as though something could have happened in that house. 
let's get that checked off first. Right? Let's get all the items of clothing bagged up that he was wearing, the shoes he wears, everything. Right? Now, as uh, Ju Julia or Jules says, she finds shoes are the best item for a dog to smell. Because clothing you wash daily. And then you've got DNA, touch DNA on the items of clothing from every, like, the mother, the child, you name it. How often do you clean the insoles of your trainers or even the inside of your trainers? You don't. I used to put mine in the wash, but now I use, like, an old toothbrush. Right? An old toothbrush. And I've we got this stuff called Vanish here. You can get it in like a liquid form or a, a cream form. And I use that on all my work, on any of my trainers. That's what I use. And I just scrub it with all this vanish over it. Then I get a damp cloth, wipe it all off. Then get a, another, clean, another cloth, still damp, and wipe it all off again. So I'm not having to get the inside of my trainers wet. And I've just found every time I put my trainers in the wash, after a couple of months, those falling apart. Right? Once I put them in the wash, just once, after a couple of months, my trainers were falling apart. So now I don't do that. I'll do it by hand. Saw this in a huge murder case in Illinois. Brown, Brown's chickens case. Six or eight murder found in back room or fridge. Palatine messed up forensics, yep. Sebastian's Law, all missing cases should be classified as a criminal. Yes, should be. Now, nah, Lord, I always jump powder into our shoes at the door or spray them every night. I couldn't imagine not doing that. Right. So... We're still going to have some smell of, like, even if you put a spray or a powder in that, inside your shoe, yeah? I tend to put powder in, in the summer because I don't always wear socks in my trainers, right? So I will put a bit of powder in the bottom. You're still going to have some of your scent in there. Still going to have some of your scent in there. Right, and that's why she prefers to use a shoe in an insole for her dogs to smell rather than an item of clothing. So, evidence I'm just kind of curious as to why they didn't look at the scene like a crime scene since we haven't seen this kid in 80 plus days. Uh, it's a question. Again, I'm not sure we have the facts on this, whether it was shut down and whether it was treated like a crime scene. What my understanding is, it has been searched. That house has been searched on multiple occasions and the grounds as well as the camper, meaning the grounds, their yard areas were searched very thoroughly on multiple occasions. I don't know if it was shut down, meaning that no one was allowed in or out that certainly should have been the protocol taken. And I I don't have reason per se to know that it wasn't done. initially. But remember, there is a huge lap of time between the time he and the time he, he was last seen alive. And that amount hmm. of time, certainly a lot can happen. Interesting. You know, I got a, a super chat that I want to get before just – you know, gets overwhelming or anything of that stuff. Uh, Cake, thank you so much for it. Uh, question to, to you, Jen. So, uh, right. She just said there's a big time between the time he was last seen and the time he was reported missing. Now, do we go on the time he was last seen as leaving this Texas roadhouse or do we go on the time of last being seen on what Katie tells us? 
at nine o'clock. Even so, there's still three hours, nine to twelve, and then another six hours, so six. That's nine hours. But if we go on the time from when you left Texas Roadhouse, we're looking at, what, eleven and a half hours? Time difference? Yeah, and you know you get these people saying, they, I don't know if any of you like, believe this, that they believe Sebastian's in that house somewhere. There would be a nasty smell coming from there by now. I don't care how much lime you used, there'd be a nasty smell. Right? There would be flies and blue flies and whatever else. There would be something, a sign to say, What's going on over there? You know what I mean? Where's that smell coming from? So, uh, I was watching a case the other day and he killed his girlfriend, but there was a nasty smell coming from their garage. So they went inside and his car was in the garage. And they said, you can't forget that smell. Once you smell it, you can't forget it. But, so they opened the boot of his car, but there was no body there. But because her body had been in there, the odour had stayed in that car and it was still there. Yep. Just tell law enforcement they look, walked out with no shoes on. They believe you. They wouldn't, I don't think they would here. If I said to them, yeah, he just walked out the house. I don't know why he went out that door, but he will. He just walked out that door. They'd be going, really? They'd be side-eyeing at me. Really? Right. I've got another leg. You want to pull that one? But um, it does happen. And it happens a lot over here, believe it or not. Uh, are results for poly given to a two person taking it same day? So, uh, good question though. Great Do question. Do you find out? Because you know, for example, for example, you, you know, I know we're kind of going back to the like the 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 embryo stasis of this this whole story, this whole case. But you know, you had uh, uh, Chris Proudfoot, you had Katie Proudfoot out here saying they took Polly's, they passed with flying colors, kind of thing. Would they go, would law enforcement tell them if they had a sufficient test result? Yes. And and I'll tell you also what happens. Is polygraphs are great, great investigative tools. In other words, I think a lot of people picture that you just walk into a room and they strap you up to all these uh, cables and cords and and, and that is what happens, and that's really not at all what happens. What happens is you're interviewed, and you're given this whole series of questions, uh, and it's meant to help ferret out somebody so they're not tempted to go and take a polygraph if they're intending to lie. Mm. So there's this whole pre-interview process that's used with sort of hanging out in the background is the polygraph machine, right, that they're looking yeah. at. And typically... You know, people who have uh, no concern in terms of telling the truth, typically, mm -hmm. they, they're like, let's go. I know. I know it's going to detect if I'm lying. And guess what? I'm not lying. And so you're going to see some very usual responses. Then after that, you know, the process is explained and, and they're hooked up. And again, there can only be a couple of questions even asked. It's usually two, maybe three and they're very pointed for a yes, no response. And everything really? is calibrated. Yo, yeah. It's not a series of questions. Okay, it's, so it's not okay, because I understand that, ahead, like, yeah. for example, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but for example, um, Seth uh, Seth Rogers did a, a polygraph, and uh the first time he did it, he started falling asleep during the poly. 
So I'm, and he said this on, on, you know, on, I think Nancy Grace, if I'm correct. Um, and he had to do the polygraph again. Are they asking the questions really slowly? Like, how does that happen <laughs> if they're only doing three questions and one falls asleep? I'm just curious about that. Any thoughts on well, that? When you, yeah. When you first start out and your question, of course, they're going to say, what's your name? You know, where you live. These are questions that are sort of benchmark questions uh, that they can take your respirations, uh, your pulse, your rate, and understand in terms of somebody who's not under stress and not lying. You know, what happens to the body when you fabricate a lie. So they do have to do the baseline. But the question they are going to ask, only literally two or three that have to do that case. And typically it's going to be, did you have anything to do with Sebastian's disappearance? Something mm. like that. Right. Did you kill Sebastian? Something like that. Do you know where Sebastian is? Those would probably be three questions, at least those premises, is that I would work with the polygrapher if I had this case to get those uh, pointed questions. So I don't know why he would follow. I know he, and I'm not saying anything about the polygrapher that Nancy Grace used. I of mean, if, if, this, if I were Seth, and obviously I've met Seth, I really appreciate him coming on and sharing his amazing uh, story and his truth about his relationship with his son. But having said that, Pascal. Right. When KP said he walked outdoor, I thought she saw him. When CP said this case will be studied for years, I knew he knew something. When CP had duper's delight about no evidence, I worried. She ha KP had a bit of duper's delight as well at the very beginning of that one interview, first interview they did with the news reel. I picked up on both the duper's delight they had. Right. That's the only sort of uh, body language I tend to pick up on is the duper's delight. Because I'm looking at their faces and I'm listening to the words, I pick up on their face reactions. I see if they roll their eyes, if they close their eyes. And like before, like Katie has this habit, had a habit of closing her eyes and thinking about what she had to say before she said it. She put her head back and closed her eyes sort of thing and then say what she has to say. So I concentrate on the face. I don't look at the hands or the body. Occasionally I might see the elbow go, right, or him cough. sort of thing. It's like someone said when they're doing that Nancy Grace interview, she was passing him something under the table or she kept, t you know, he kicked, he was tapping her foot under the table. How they know that, I don't know, because you can see it. But apparently he tapped her foot under the table and she looked down when he done it. So that is another interview I'd like to go over. But that's another note. This is a better one. The place for a polygraph is in a law enforcement environment, I believe, not on a show. And I think that that just added to really all of this drama we're seeing and all of the sensationalizing of this mm -hmm. case. And, and it's, it's really... Uh, so I don't know exactly the parameters they did, but I can tell you the parameters that we do in criminal cases. And as a person who got polygraphed every three years to keep my uh, security clearances, you know, top right. secret, highest levels, you have to be polygraphed at least every three years to hold those clearances, if not more. And so I'm very familiar with the process. Very interesting. There's another part to, the, to this super chat that I want to get to, too. Um, does law enforcement lie to third parties about results to keep investigation quiet, like reporters? So typically, 
I will tell you, I know a lot of people believe that law enforcement lies to get to an end. What law enforcement does is they just won't talk. That's typically uh, what they do when they do not. Right. Necro. I just think about how useless I'd be. I don't you know, even know if I could do interviews. My eyes would swell shut from all the tears. I don't think I could do interviews. I don't think I would. I would do them, but I wouldn't be answering any of their questions because I'd be saying, whoever's got my child, who's ever got my grandchild, give him back. Give them back back to me now. I wouldn't care about any of the questions that they was asking. I'd just be saying, I want my child back. He's not yours. He's mine. You know what I mean? I'll just be putting out that plea constantly. Yes, KP had all you said. KP also tapped on table as if to call it all of the story. It was very interesting. Yes. Yeah. But I, I do believe on that by that time she did that interview with Chronicles of Olivia, she was on some medication. She's probably on medication on that first interview, to be honest with you. But I just think it hadn't kicked in enough. Right? Because it's like, I just felt like she wanted to say something, but she couldn't. Necro, yeah, I'd spend my entire exposure begging for the child to come home. I'd be useless otherwise, just the idea sends me into a panic, I know. It's like my son, I've got a door chain on my, a, a, like a chain on my door. And I used to keep it on my door all the time. And my son has said, what's the point of me having a key to get into your place if you've got the chain on the door, Mum? Right? Why if I need to get into you something urgently, you know what I mean, and I need to get to you, I can't get in. So now, I don't keep the chain on the door. The only time I have the chain on the door is when my grandkids are here. But now... My grandson has figured out how to take the chain off the door and unlock the door. So I'm looking at getting another chain put on but at the top of the door. Right? Another chain put on. Or even a key, key lock, one I have to use for the key. Because my door, I only have to use the key to get in the door. When I'm in the door, I pull the handle up turning up, my door is locked. Right, so I'm looking at maybe they're getting another keychain put on the top of the door. Not too high up because I can't reach too high, but high enough where my grandson can't reach it, even if he's still on a flipping stool. So that's what I'm looking at doing, is putting another chain on my door. And that's just, not for me, that's just to make sure they're safe, that they can't get out while I'm asleep. Not very often I don't hear them because I've just noticed there's like a creak, creaky floorboard just by their, inside their bedroom door. And that's what I hear. I hear when he climbs off his bed and I hear him coming into my, coming out of the room because of that creaky floorboard. And when I hear that, I just pull my covers back open. He comes in, climbs into the bed with me, and he goes back to sleep. Right? I would, I'd be pleading with them. I wouldn't be answering any questions. They could fire the questions at me. But I wouldn't be answering any. I'd just be going, I don't care about these questions. I just want my, my grandson home. I want my son home. I want my daughter home. Please, whoever's got him, dropping off at outside the hospital, outside uh, by a gas station, you know what I mean, anywhere, anywhere like a hospital, a police station, or a gas station, and tell them to go in and phone 911.
not want to say yes or no to something, or they will give the statement, which I've seen constantly in this case. There's no proof that anything bad happened. Everybody is, you know, no one's been cleared per se. And, and, but we're investigating this as a missing person as if he walked away. So they've been very unclear, right? It's a, it's a soup sandwich in terms of us in the public being able to get really anything out of law enforcement in this case. But back to the question is, no, typically law enforcement will not lie about a polygraph result or anything like that. They'll typically say, listen, they, they passed. But what I wish we could see in this case is what we saw in the Brian Koberger case. In that case, law enforcement came out every week with a list of cleared individuals. Mm. And they added to it each week. Jacks are cleared. Jack is cleared. Uh, you know, the DoorDash guy is cleared. The, uh, they cleared Two the, surviving the, roommates the are cleared. Yes. Yeah. It's like, you know, on the Summer Moon Utah Wells case, you know, like Andy B. Is it Andy B? He's been cleared by the police. He's the only one so far who's been cleared by law enforcement on that case. He's been cleared. Right, he's the only one. So why can't they, if they pass their test, why can't they stand there and say on the Engel Press the interview, they've all done a polygraph, Chris Proudfoot, Katie Proudfoot, Seth Proudfoot, have all done a polygraph, they have all passed. We know uh, Seth has because it's been on Nancy Grace, right? I was seven, came home, Necro. I was seven, came home to no one in the city, went to police department. We were always told to go there if we were lost. I'm a 70s aged child. He had to hunt down relatives. Yeah. Well, when I grew up, right, my brothers used to walk me to school and my younger sister. Right? We always had someone walking us to school. But my mum always picked us up from school. But then... As we got that, as we went up in the years in the school, my mum moved up in her career. She she worked for school meals, right? So at one stage she was able to be she was home by what? Uh, I think it was half two. So she was always able to come and meet us. But as she progressed up the ladder, sort of thing, she was working till three thirty, even four o'clock sometimes because she had all this paperwork to do, right? And so it got to the point where my brothers would walk, we'd always walk home with one of them, but we was taught from a very young age our name and our address, right? And we was told if ever we got lost anywhere, we was to find a police officer because then, guys, there was always a police officer walking the beat, always. Nowadays, phew, never there, right? But when I grew up, there's always a, a beat officer. And we was told, go to the beat, go to a police officer, tell them your name and where you live, and they can sort, they will bring you home. I remember once we come home from school, was at senior secondary school, which you like call high school, right? And we got home and my mum wasn't home. And it was freezing cold, there was snow on the ground, everything. So we was just standing outside the house by the steps and my neighbour saw us. And she said, you're coming here. So my we went into my neighbours. It was a bit weary at first because of football, you know what I mean? Not because we were scared of him. It was just that we was going into someone else's home and we had to remember our P's and Q's. Right? So, um, but then she seen my mum walking past the house and she said, oh, your mum's here now. So she's gone to the door and my mum's going, oh, thank you. For some reason, she got held up. Don't know why it was now because I'm going back many, many years. 
she got held up. Probably because it was the bad weather with the buses maybe or transport or something. She got held up. But we was always taught from a young age. Our name, how to write our name before we even went to school. We was taught how to write our name and how to write our full address before we even started school. You know, we didn't start school till we was, what, say, I think it was five then, because you didn't have nurseries then. You didn't have nurseries or preschool or all this lot, where they can start at the age of two. <laughs> I think that's too young, two or three is too young for any child, right? I think they should be at home until they're at least P1 age. And my son never went to nursery because he missed out on the intake because we just moved house. He went to a playgroup Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Then on a Tuesday and a Thursday, he went to a different playgroup. So every morning he was at a playgroup. So it wasn't as if he wasn't mixing with other children. Right? And once he started school, I was taking my daughter then, who was, who was going to uh, play groups herself. But because we moved, I had to find a new play group. So we found a new play group for my daughter to go to. But until he could start school, I kept him at these play groups. I kept him going to these play groups. So that he wouldn't, he'd still be interacting with other children. But we didn't, when I grew up, there's no such thing as nurseries. You learn to write your name and your address and the ABC and the ABCs at home before you started school. I was the only one, believe it or not, I was the only one in my uh, year one infants class, what we used to call infants, year one, who could, at the time, I know it sounds silly now, but at the time, I was the only one who could spout tricycle. No one else could, because my mum would sit with us. My mum didn't go back to work until both me and my youngest sister were in school full-time. And there was no part-time school. It's once you started school, you was there from 9am till 3.30am, uh, 3.30pm. There's no, oh, you start at 9, but you finish at 12. No, there was none of that. You was there from 9am till 3.30am. So, that's how old I am. They cleared people as they passed polygraphs, so they didn't discuss about polygraphs, but it's all about the whole picture, right? So, likely passing polygraphs along with alibis, along with the totality of what they saw from digital information, cleared them. I'd love to see that here. Because we are not seeing that here, to me, it does point to the direction of they are still being considered. Mm -hmm. But I think we mm. cannot, and I've said this from the beginning, Pascal, we cannot jump on Katie Proudfoot killing Sebastian. We just can't do that. No, that's very true. That's very true. I, we, I mean, we, we, well, I, I, I agree. I, I hear you on that. I, I do think that there's a lot of things. I use this analogy a lot. There's a lot of things on the table. And I think that's one of the options that's on the table. I don't think it, it's the main thing, but it's on the table. You see what I'm saying? It could have been he he lashed out, ran out the door. He could have been punished, and she closed the door on him and said, you know, if you're going to keep acting out like this, uh, you can stay outside. And she shut the door, and then when she walked back out there, he was gone. You know, uh, the the options options in this situation are endless because we don't have anything, right? This, this kid literally, as Seth said one time, this kid literally like used the force almost and just levitated out the house, you know, leaving no trail of anything, which is so very odd. Now, I, I, okay, and, and this this goes back to what we were talking about with FBI and all that, and it goes back to this video I just played where Seth I, is expressing his concerns about this problem? becoming a cold case. What can there be? What can be done to prevent it from becoming a cold case right now? Well, I think I have a real discussion about. I guess going to a cold case, we have to understand the definition of a cold case. What is a cold case? A cold case is a case that is not being actively worked. It's something that's sitting back on the shelf. It's I it, it's Summer Wells is the perfect example. Yeah, cold mm -hmm. case. 
No one is actively working at meaning. A guy or a detective isn't getting up every morning and investigating, not you know, interviewing, uh, not searching, uh, not looking at records. They're not actively investigating. So by definition, a cold case, uh, no one is actively working. And that's okay. what Seth is worried about. I think we're far from that at this time with Sebastian. I would be worried too as a parent, uh, but we're far away from that, I believe, at this point because people are still searching, not law enforcement per se, but other people that are going to find clues. And I think law enforcement is still actively searching and probably anyone to look hard at Katie Proud. Interesting. Um, and, and of course, I would understand them looking at her. I mean, just just doing logically speaking, she's the last person to see Sebastian living and breathing. So, of course, instantly, everyone, everyone should be looking in that direction. That doesn't mean admission of guilt. That doesn't mean that she's guilty of anything. But still, that's that's the angle. That's the 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 avenue, right? That's the direction. Um, but okay, you know, we we have this investigation going and all that. We do all have a father. So he's been those vote out here as late expressing his concerns. You saw that in the video. He's going, I don't want this to turn into a cold case. So to make things even, since you are former FBI agent, former law enforcement, you know you've dealt with some grief. Yeah, because I was listening to something today, right? And if that front door was a self-locking door, right, it would mean it was shut on its own. You'd open it and it would shut automatically, yeah? So doors like, I know my front door, it's a self-locking door. Well, no, it isn't a self-locking. I still have to use the key to lock it when I go out. But when it shuts, because it's a fire door as well, it's got that hinge on it, and it don't half make a thud when it shuts. To the point where my doorbell kept falling off the door that's why now when i go in the door i have to hold the door and slowly let it shut because it makes such a thud a bang and my doorbell will fall off and so if it's something like that which closes automatically as you go out right then it would make a thud and i think I'm not changing my view, don't get me wrong. I'm looking at the fact that if she did put him out there on the night time, could have been early, well, just after he took the bins out maybe, right? So it could have been about 7 o'clock. And she put him out there, no shoes on, as a punishment, Right? He's gone for a walk about. The, I still can't get the fact there's no scent of him. Right? Only that one dog picked up a scent. All three dogs are sea pieces. Which all went to the retention pond. But surely there'd be a scent of him going to the bus stop. Because... I also heard that apparently he was he went to the bus stop early one morning without his mum knowing. And she had to go and get him back. Hi Gigi. Right? She went and got him back because it was way too early for his bus. So I'm thinking, is this the first time he's walked out? Or walked away. And then she's gone to get him back in. And thinking where's he gone. So. I'm thinking that way at the moment. If if he has walked off. I'm thinking that. And she could be feeling guilty. That rocking back and forth. is feeling guilty. Because she's thinking. It's my fault, it's my fault, I put him outside, he had no shoes on, he's gone walk about, and that's why she's rocking back and forth, and that's, it's like she wants to tell the truth, but she can't, I don't know why she feels she can't tell the truth, 
because something definitely happened on the Sunday night. Yeah, she's got regret from something. Either something happened in the house on the night time, because why was his bedroom light flashing, keep coming on and off? Right? Uh, some security camera, I, I believe, caught that. So something either happened in the house or she put him outside as a punishment. Because it, perhaps he wouldn't go to sleep. You know what I mean? Perhaps it was about nine o'clock and she put him outside because he wasn't settling down or half nine. So I don't believe in putting a child outside to calm down. I don't. So when my grandson goes off on one, we just say, sweetheart, go to your bedroom, calm down for me, and when you've calmed down, we will talk. Right? And you hear him go, thud all the way up my hallway, bump, 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 he goes up my hallway, I jump, and he's shouting this, and I hate you, and all this lot. Yeah, that's fine, I love you. Right? Just no matter how many times he says, I hate you to me, I say, that's okay. But you know what, Ellis? I love you. I always say that to him. And he'll go in his room and he might be tip all his toys over on the floor, pull his covers off his bed, his pillow off the bed. Right. And then after about 10 minutes, he's calmed down. I go in to check on him. I go, oh, you're playing now, are you? Yeah. Do you want to talk? No. I'm ha I'm okay now. You sure you don't want to talk about what upset you? No. And so I say, but I do. I need to talk to you, Barry. But I don't want to talk about it. I say, okay, we'll leave it at that. And then later on, I'll try again with him to get him to talk about why he can't behave like he did. You know what I mean? Or say what he did. But I put it in such a way that it's not pointing at him personally. I bring it into a conversation like, do you know children that talk disrespectful to their parents or to a relative? That's not nice. But I don't bring him in it to it personally. I don't say, you know, the way you spoke to me wasn't nice. I, I bring it in as a the way... As I'm talking about some other children, because if I bring it in as though I'm talking about what he said, he won't want to know. He won't want to talk about it. But he does talk to someone, and there's one person he will talk to, and that's my daughter. You know what I mean? His aunt. He talks to her all the time. If she's here visiting, and he's here, She'll go and sit with him and read with him and she'll talk to him. And he'll listen to her and he'll talk to her, but he won't talk to me. You know what I mean? Okay. Why won't you talk to me, but you will talk to your aunt? So, just ways of go working with him, really. Even families, some concerned <laughs> parents, and all that. What can TBI, local law enforcement, Sumner County, sheriff's office and whatnot what can they do right now to calm seth's mind to make him feel like there is actual movement going on in their part of this investigation pascal again you always and i'm not just saying this you always ask such good questions and i think questions that are on the minds of your viewers this is what i believe should happen uh in the bureau we had something called a witness victim coordinator and they were amazing. They were highly trained individuals, both from the standpoint of education, as well as um, on the job training, if you will, understanding the nexus between a case agent and a criminal investigation and the loved ones that are anguishing over what is happening. And they served as the middle person to be 24 seven on call to verbally, I mean, I think Seth brought up a great point to verbally communicate with that person, to go to their house, Mm -hmm. you know, to alleviate some of the stress and some of the fear. And right. Was it you who said it before? Someone else said about the dew or frost on the grass. 
and I mentioned it the other week, if he walked out during the night, there'd be dew or frost on the grass. It would leave a footprint. Right? Because I tell you now, we had a problem, right? It's not nice, what I'm talking about. We had a problem with rats in our, around our garden, right? And we used to have to put these rat traps out and everything. But every morning, you knew when you got rats in the garden because you could see the trail they would take. And they always went up along the side of the fence. They always go up by a wall. But occasionally, you'd see a run where they'd run across the garden. Right? And so that was because of the dew on the grass. So, yes, there would be a, a footprint there or something. The scent could be from any... Yes, I said that as well. I said that scent that dog picked up could have been from Saturday. Because we don't know what they did on the Saturday. Could have been from the Friday after school. He could have gone for a walk about then. And that's how he goes around, round the back where the house is, down to the bottom and up the road. It could have been from any day, that scent. So. His dad said he could tell the time, but he wasn't good on timing. So, like, uh, his dad said once they planned to go, I think it was fishing. Right? And his dad said, right, we'll go fishing at this time. But just let me know when you're ready. And it was about two o'clock in the afternoon. He said, I thought we was going fishing. His dad said, that was this morning, but you never come back to me. You see, he's got no aspect of time difference. He just thinks, he doesn't think of time. He just sees it as, I'm going fishing today. He doesn't look at it, we're well, going to go fishing in the morning or we're going fishing in the afternoon. He just looks at it as one, we're going fishing today. This is a much plausible theory than him offering and some crazy cover-up. Yep. I haven't heard as much discussion on the bedroom light ever. No, I haven't. You know what I mean? I agree. SG, I agree with ne Necro. As an adult, I'll get ready and head to work a full 12 hours early if I had if I have an high anxiety and wake up feeling disorientated, especially sleep aid. <sighs> no, I've got a sleep aid because I wasn't sleeping. Right? I really wasn't. If I was getting two hours of sleep a night and it was getting to the point where I would do everything and anything to make myself tired. I was cleaning my house every day from top to bottom. I'd be scrubbing my kitchen floor and my bathroom floors and my tiles and all this lot. Right? I'd be on my hands and knees cleaning. And I still wasn't tired. And it was getting to the point where I was going to slap someone if I went out. I told my doctor this. I said, look... I said, there's a couple walking in front of me, a good distance, well, about 10, 12 feet in front of me. They're doing nothing. They're just walking down the street. And I just wanted to slap them. So, and she said, look, you need to get some sleep because it's like I get up in the morning and I think I've got to go to the shop. So I get up have my coffee, have a wash, get dressed and all this. Well, I go and get me wash, and then I go and sort my clothes out. But then I put my clothes on the bed, and I think, hold on, 
and I'll go off somewhere else and then I think, oh, I've got to clean my kitchen. So I'll start cleaning my kitchen. Then I think, then halfway through cleaning my kitchen, I think, I'd see some on my living room floor. Oh, God. And I'd get the vacuum out and start vacuuming. So I wasn't getting any one job finished totally. And it was taking me from 8 in the morning through to like 9 p.m., 10 p.m. at night before I, I was done all my jobs, literally. And my son said, no, I liked a little bit of ADHD. And I went, you can go F yourself with the ADHD, right? And it's because my mind was going over time. And so she put me on this medication, which keeps, is to help me sleep and is to keep me calm. She said to me once, she said, do you have any thoughts of uh, unaliving yourself, right? I've never had that thought, never, ever. And, but I said to him, I said, excuse me, I live on the 14th floor. If I want to unalive myself, I've only got to open a window. But I wouldn't because I... I don't like heights, so there's no way I'm going to climb up onto a window to jump out. I couldn't do it. I'd physically be sick, so that's not going to happen, right? But, so I take this medication, but I take it about 10, between 10 and 11 at night. But um, it just wipes me out. Um, if I go up at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's like, ugh. And I'll fall asleep again by half 8, 9 o'clock. I make myself a coffee, but I'm asleep again on the sofa. Then I wake up about 10, I'll take my tablet that I have to take in the morning. And because I've been up so early, I'm, I'm useless for that day then. And I'm constantly having a nap on the sofa. Constantly. I don't know about the biochemical factors, but all visual proofs, they are very similar. I do believe Necro, SG, Necro, I do believe he was locked out. However, I thought he'd make a scene having a panic attack meltdown. Melatonin makes me feel hungover like a drunken stupor, so I don't ever recommend that. <laughs> and I tell you something, I was only on one medication at the time, and my son had a New Year's Eve party. Right? I was only on this one tablet that I have to take for the next three years, every morning, for the next three years. And I thought, oh, I'll be all right. And so I had a drink, and I'd started drinking about 6 p.m., if not a bit earlier. And we was laughing because my son couldn't have a drink because he had to go and pick someone up or something. Right? I'm not joking. And I did say to him, I said, look, I'll probably pass out by 10 p.m. Because that's what happens, I pass out by 10 p.m. I, I fall asleep. About half ten, I literally, literally slid down the wall onto the floor. And I crawled in out their living room, along their little hallway, into my grandson's bedroom. Right? He was still awake. Right? There's no way he was going to sleep. There's too many people there. So I slid and I fell asleep on their bed on his bedroom floor. They've come in and helped me up onto his bunk bed. How I got up there, I don't know. Then there's a big ruckus going on with my son and his neighbour from upstairs. So I've got off the bunk bed and I've gone to the front door and all I seen was my son being held back by two of his friends and some police officers holding this other guy back. I said, get him in here. So they've dragged my son in and we've shut the door. I've then gone in the bathroom and fell asleep on the bathroom floor. From there, they've had to come and get me 
and put me into their bed. And at the time, they've had police officers coming in, asking them about what's been going on. And one was in the bedroom talking to my, I think it was my daughter-in-law. And she said, it's all right, that's my mother-in-law. So I just put my hand up to say, I'm alive, I'm alive. <laughs> just leave me alone, but I'm alive. Right? But that was just taking one tablet. So now because I'm on two tablets, one in the morning and one for my sleep and anxiety, I do not drink no more. Honest to God, I don't drink. I don't get mine. I come home that night as well, caught, took, caught a taxi with two, three friends. I was fine. They woke me up again when I was in their bedroom because Trace was saying about this ruckus with my son and his neighbour and how the neighbour had threatened my grandkids. Woof! I'm out of that bed. I'm literally going out of that front door and now I have to shut the door and stop me from going out there because I was ready to go up them stairs and kick this guy's door in. You know what I mean? Because of the threat he made towards my grandkids. But I'm wide awake by now and I'm sitting in the kitchen after that. I'm drinking coffee. Right? <laughs> but... I believe it's possible she over-medicated him. Possibly because if he's overstimulated, he's not going to settle down. I do. Definitely don't drink now. If I ever feel well, we will kick doors in together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honest to God, I was. I was going to head out of their flat and go up the, I think it would be two floods. I think he lived on the top floor. But I was ready to go up there and kick his door in just because he threatened to set fire to their flat with my grandkids in it. Right? Well, because of where my son works and what job he does, then this guy apologised to my son and my son accepted it. Right? Because they live in the same block. And I went, that's you, Simon. I don't have to accept it. I will never forgive that guy for what he said. Never. I don't care if he's high on whatever and drink whatever. I was I was out of it. I was totally blanked out of it. But I didn't go around threatening to set someone out flat on fire. I went I was going to go and kick his door in and put him six foot under. Right? <laughs> But I didn't want to set a f his flat on fire. So, God, we've still got so much of this. In, you know, the parents of Sebastian, of being able to communicate with them much because of this circus show that they know is going on. Make no mistake, there are people in law enforcement that are monitoring social media and they see this hot mess going on. And what law enforcement always asks the parents is please put your son's name out, put his face out, help people to connect with your son. You know who did a very nice job of this was Riley Strain's family. They did a good mm. job of just, you know, putting his face and name out there, Pascal, but he didn't get what's happened here. I mean, the ugliness in this case is at pitch level. And law yeah. enforcement knows that Sebastian, or I'm sorry, Seth and Katie and Chris will run to any YouTuber that has a pulse and will run to any TikToker with a pulse, anybody, and and start talking about yeah. the other parties involved and about speculation and about, and that is a big problem. So they don't trust them. I'm just going to say it. that's a problem. Well, let me look, look, if I can interject, I, I uh, you know, and I hear you 100%. I mean, the, you know, it's, it's, it has gone off the rails. I mean, that's, that goes without saying. I mean, you know, I was just talking about that last night, how things just really have gone off the rails and we're, we have lost focus and the focus is on Sebastian. But I also will say, and I mean, of course, you know, just using loosely Riley Strain's case is that there was constant updates. There were constant pieces of nuggets and news and, and everything. Whereas this one, he went missing in late in late February. All yep. we know is that he left with his the clothes on his back, with no shoes, a flashlight, and not his cell phone, and the glasses on his face. That's all we know. No, no, no stitch of nothing. No scent. No footprints. No, no nothing. 
And it's been the same like that for 80 plus days. So I can understand things going a little crazy, things getting a little wild because of the things that have been building up as of late, the drama that's been building around this case and all that and concerned parents speaking out. Um, because I, 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 I can't relate, but I can understand, right? But because we don't have everything, because we don't know any new developments, it's starting to eat away at people's own mental <laughs> own mental health, right? It's 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 starting to become uh, uh, people going a little crazy, right? Um, and so that's kind of the thing I've noticed. It's we had body cam footage on Riley. We we had people looking at street street cams, getting able being able to grab certain things. There was so much there for us to consume and 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 break down and look at and. Also, there was no east side versus west side type thing. There was no bad guy to look at. You see what I'm saying? We were there was we believe that there could be a bad guy out there, but there was no, you know, family to stand against because the families were together and working in unison. In fact, they even had their own uh, person, uh, a family friend, to speak for them on on their on the family's behalf whenever they couldn't get on to these podcasts and these interviews as well. But because I think there was more stuff, more info for the people, for the public to consume, I think it was a lot easier to ride with. Whereas this one, there's nothing and everyone's just. Well, I think two know? points. First of all, I want to make clear that when I say on anybody and everybody's YouTube and you know Twitter, I'm not whining any uh, of these creators or TikTokers. What I'm trying no. to say is that law enforcement is concerned, right? that they will say something that will proliferate that they don't want said because they've already seen a lot of things being said that is very inflammatory. So I mm -hmm. want to make that clear that that's the point I'm talking about um, because it is so important to keep his name and his face out there. Every, I hope every YouTuber on the planet and every TikToker is in, in you know, Instagrammer. We need his name and face out there if he's going to be found. Uh, but back to your your point on the Riley Strain different, you really said, in a sense, what I was going to add is that Riley Strain's case completely different. I think uh, from the facts and circumstances, from everyone in law enforcement, uh, it was very clear that he had fallen in that river. Mm -hmm. And there was so much video and, and so much information, as you mentioned, there wasn't a bad guy. There wasn't some possible bad guy involved. This is so different because the possible bad guy could be Katie, could be somebody else, or quite frankly, Sebastian Rogers could have walked away and is with somebody right now mm -hmm. uh, on, you know, you know, kidnapped or otherwise. I mean, it's a possibility that has to be, that has to be considered. I want to really quickly point out Connor Jack Oswald. And this is the case that I think gives me hope and why this is the case I was talking about earlier. A lot of people will say on my Twitter, Jennifer, you know, Katie did it, or, you know, he's not alive. They say things like this, of course, right. because everybody's concerned. Connor Jack Oswald walked out of his life. On, he's on the, he was on the autistic spectrum at 17. Now that's not much of an age difference, barely a couple of years. Very true. And he was found two and a half years later, homeless, recognized by someone and returned back to his family. Thank goodness. I know I believe in miracles. I'm a warm and fuzzy person. That's why we do it, Pascal, right? Absolutely. That's what we care about Sebastian. We're hoping one day to get the call. Oh, yeah. But also a realist, I mean, I do understand is every day ticks by, there's less of a chance that we're going to find Sebastian. I understand that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's frustrating. And I, I, and I get it, you know, the, the frustration and why people feel some type of way. But I think that I, I think instead of us looking outward and looking at the enemy which is you know the 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 lack of information right the the fact that things are being held against you know held uh like the truth in all that that is the the main focus i feel that we all should be having right now it's finding sebastian the frustration of finding sebastian not trying to uh cannibalize you know what i mean like, like coming after each other and and all that coming after the people that are involved in the case to me that just makes people want to stay away from the case not want to work on the case so on and so forth you know um hence the reason why you know uh, i appreciate you being here and being a part of the conversation here uh talking about 
the possibilities and the, and the the things of what we know and what we could expect in the uh, in the near future. Now, I do have some um, super chats that I want to grab here really quick before they, you know, do this. Uh, Melly, thank you so much. Love this duo. Welcome, Jen. Of course, you know, Hi. Jennifer Coffin Diver has a, a really great podcast. She just started a couple months ago. It's called Break the Case. Definitely go check it out. She's obviously a correspondent for News Nation, uh, and she does some really great work. Um, she's been on the show many, many times before. We've covered a lot of stuff with her. Uh, cover, covered a lot of different cases uh, with her uh, and just her bringing her FBI expertise on on these certain cases. So I appreciate that. S-Dub, uh, is this a what if or is this a legit happening? What a great question. I like how, are, are you a writer? <laughs> Whoever wrote that? Uh, <laughs> Shout out to my mod. Writer. That's my who, mod, S-Dubs. S-W. Oh. SW that's one of your Explorers. mods? Yeah, yeah, that's, Explorers. Yeah, that's, she's, that's she's awesome. good mod. No, I yeah. like how she even worded that. Yeah. Um, is it, it's I don't think it's a who done this. I, I say that there's one thing that's always always, and I put on it very early on. There was a Facebook group, and in that Facebook group, a mom and a daughter. The mom actually came forward and said, "Listen, I just saw Sebastian on Saturday or something. I've already told the police. They know all about it." Okay. Now that ended up being wrong. She it, it was somebody who looked like Sebastian. It wasn't Sebastian. But this this is the nugget I got out of that correspondence. Katie Proudfoot went on that Facebook and she said, did he have shoes? And the reason Katie Proudfoot asked that, I think was because she was trying in her mind to, to was it really him? Because he didn't have shoes on. Could it really be him? Now, based on my experience, someone who murdered somebody or accidentally killed somebody and then threw him in a dumpster, right. they're not gonna ask that question. They're, they're not, they're just going to be watching and, and looking at the different conversations. They're not going to engage like that. That is one thing that always made me wonder. I, it gave me legitimacy to the fact that he could have walked away and that Katie might not be involved. Now, there's been a lot of other things since that have given me pause. But right now, I think it is very plausible that he walked away. It's plausible. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it is plausible. It, it, it definitely is. Uh, and, you know, that's the story that you told earlier, uh, just a little bit about, uh, about Connor, right? Connor Blackburn? Was it uh, Blackburn? No, Connor, Connor Jack Oswald. If Why do I have Blackburn to... in my head? <laughs> <laughs> Oswald. Cool okay. name. Because cool I remember, name. yeah. Uh, you know, I got to write that down. But uh, uh, I remember hearing about that case. Um, and he was living only miles away from his home, where he apparently just disappeared from as well. Um, and so, yeah, it, there is a good possibility that he just up and walked out. Um, that could very well be it. Um, but I do have a couple, uh, a few more. So let me grab these really quick. Carbonized. Uh, so what does the evidence thus far suggest? That's a good question. Too. See, my fam, they, we don't mess around. We got questions. Great questions. They're brilliant. But what do you think? All the evidence that you've heard so far, you've seen, we've talked about this, and we've covered this case at nauseum as well, um, talking about the same things, right, about the, the same clues that we have, which is not much, uh, or it hasn't changed much, let's just say that. What does the evidence for you say about this, of what happened to Sebastian Rogers? I'm going to say the evidence right now that we all know and can see, touch, and feel, there is nothing that shows foul play from an evidentiary standpoint. In other words, is Katie Proudfoot such a mastermind that she was able in those hours to just cover everything up? Perhaps, perhaps, and dispose of a body without any sign? I, mm. that's really, that, that's one thing that's really stuck with me. It's, you know, it's difficult law enforcement. It's difficult to pull a poly it happens. It happens. Yeah. I have to keep my needle. Even though there's been some things that really bother me, I mm -hmm. have to keep the needle that he could still be found. I'm keeping my needle there, Pascal, with reservation that he could be found. Absolutely. I mean, I understand. I mean, the evidence is it's not enough. And it's all just polarizing. It's all on the fence. It doesn't mean foul play. It doesn't mean he ran. It doesn't mean Katie had anything to do with it. It doesn't mean that uh, Chris had anything to do with it. It doesn't even mean that a neighbor had anything to do with it. It's just all still just kind of a, a, a blanket <laughs> stalemate, which is very, very frustrating. Real quick, uh, Barbara, thank you th so much. Do you think CP is hindering the investigation by, by not allowing property to be searched by dogs? Good question. I mean, yes. You know, you, you, 
just imagine, and I know all of your listeners have, because I can tell they're looking into this in an intellectual way, but a heartfelt way. If you, your son, if you got up and your autistic spectrum child had left in this manner, mm -hmm. I dare say that all of us would do anything in our power to welcome law enforcement, to say, do whatever you need to do, whenever you need to do it. Now, yesterday, the day after it all happened, we're a hundred percent. Now recall law enforcement has said that they have fully cooperated, but I, I know what your uh, listener is speaking about. And certainly, you know, uh, I heard that report. Well, I didn't hear that report. I saw it written out uh, by Chris Proudfoot. Um, so it's concerning. Um, and, and I don't understand it. And that's again, something that gives pause. I'm going to say it gives pause. It's something yeah. as an investigator that I put it over on this side and say, that's not lining up. Right. Math ain't mathing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't make sense. And you just kind of have to roll with it. And that is frustrating because instantly you're going, Ooh, but I want I still want to sit here and say like innocent until proven guilty. But then this stuff comes out and you're like, Oh, that's weird. That's weird. But I'm gonna stay here, but I'm looking at it, but I'm stay here. So I get what you're saying. 110%. And it, it can be very frustrating. And I think that's what's so frustrating for everybody else right now. It's that, uh, you know, it's either they're leaning on one side really, really hard and then something happens and it averts their eyes a little bit, but they're like, I'm going to keep an eye on that though. Cause that could be, that could mean innocence or that could mean more guilt, but I'm gonna stay on my side. And I think that's what's going on here right now as we speak too with everybody in the chats and the in forums and all that stuff as well. Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, so sheriff, count, uh, Sumner County Sheriff's Office, TBI, is taking evidence seriously by uh, searchers, is not taking uh, taking evidence seriously by searchers, allegedly. Some dis disposed of personal relationships between uh, Sumner County Sheriff's Office, TBI, and CP, and family alleged. So um, that is true. He did say in the interview uh, in the beginning that Seth said he's getting that there's they have plenty of evidence that they want to give to law enforcement, but apparently they're having a hard time getting that evidence to law enforcement. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I've heard some crazy, crazy uh, stories about, oh, we found a, you know, we found some material, material. We found a, a pad, found this and this, and we tried to get a for crying out loud or a hoodie, try to get to the, get law enforcement. And they just kind of looked at it and threw it on the ground. Why are we hearing or seeing this kind of alleged treatment of said evidence, potential evidence revolve around this case. Well, I want to draw another analogy that crimers in your audience that have been around for the last couple of years. Right. I'm going to say something to that comment, Ellie. Right. Are they teeth marks or could they be scratches from uh, like branches and brambles and bushes? Is it just what we want to see? Do we want to see teeth marks? Or is it just scratches from brambles and trees? Right? Could it be from the dogs? Right? Now you say those from the dogs. Now, months ago, before Christmas it was. Was it before Christmas? Oh, yeah, before Christmas. That's Joe. Um, I took in my son's cat, the cat I got for Ellis, my granddaughter and grandson, because this cat, Bobby, was being, was attacking, I mean, physically going for the mother, right? And she was, she was to the point where she was on antibiotics because he was biting her, scratching her, and she was on antibiotics. Right? The other day, I seen her, and I said, oh, are those still from a cat? She's still got scars to this day from where the cat attacked her. Right? Now, since he's been here, he's not once attacked me, but he's got a friend. He's got Toby. So every so often you hear the cats going, ow, ow, at each other, and your fur is flying. But I go and go, enough. And they literally 
Stop what they're doing, look at me, and walk away. Right? They were doing it before I went live. They were fighting by my feet, and they were screeching at each other and everything. I went, enough. And then they'd go up and walked away. So, it could be from the dogs. Right? What I'd like to know is, did Seth see him playing with the dogs? Because Seth was at their house for the first three days. And he said that's when these bites and scratches happened, round about then. Right? But I don't know. But I, I will say, scratch marks, if they're, if they're bagging off Kang's scar, my daughter-in-law is proof. I don't know about my daughter, because she went out one night to get her cat from under the car, this car, because there's some other cats there. So she's gone out and grabbed her cat to get him into safety. But her cat was in defence mode, so her cat went for her to the point where she had to go and get antibiotics. But I don't think she's still got, I'm not sure if she's still got the scratch marks and bite marks, but I said, don't ever go for a cat when there's two other cats around because they're in a defence, he's defending himself and he thinks you're attacking him then. And that's what happened with my daughter. Right? And then for about a week after, she'd go to the cat, look what you've done to me. Look at what you've done to my leg. And she'd show him the scratches on her leg. And this cat would look at her and walk away with his head down. So he knew what he'd done was wrong. But I said, you can't blame him. He was in defensive mode. And she never did, really. But I don't know if she's still got scars, but I know my daughter-in-law still got scars. I'd love to see CP arms. See, hold on. I'm going through this. I'd love to see CP's arms myself to come to a conclusion that I believe. Yeah. Refer, refer to Zoom picture on 1111 True Crime Blackout. Yeah, she's got it all on there. But scars, uh, scratches. I might yeah. remember the case of Michael Vaughn. Michael Vaughn was a little kiddo, I, I believe six years old. I believe he was reported missing. Um, it reminds me so much of this case, and no one could find him. No one found him. You know, there were dogs, there were everything just like what happened with Sebastian. And now, of course, it's believed that a neighbor, when he was when uh, Michael Vaughn left to probably go to this water park or go visit a neighbor uh, because it's very well tracked, uh, the different neighbors he went and visited, uh, that he was snatched. And, and law enforcement certainly seems to believe he was murdered. They dug up this neighbor's entire yard. They held the neighbor, Wandra, for quite a while. Uh, and in any event, uh, they've never had charges yet. But in that case, uh, there were so many instances of searchers as the case started to go cold I hate to even use that word, but as the case started to drag along, mm -hmm. uh, that somebody along the side of the road, I remember this very particularly, a searcher uh, said that they found, I think, um, some clothes or, or something that gave them a lot of concern. And I remember law enforcement said, you know, we're not going to go out there. And of course, this was months and months after everything happened and law enforcement believed they had thoroughly searched that area. So not that they didn't believe there was something there, but rather they knew they searched it. So why are we going to go back now and go right. pick up something of all? What I think law enforcement should always do is respond. I know they don't. That that's, takes time and it takes a report because anything you do, you have to write it or it doesn't happen. So yeah. they would have to go out there, take the time, collect it as potential evidence and do a write up and store it and then probably have to do another write up to get permission from their supervisor to throw it away once they find it's not relevant. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're looking at um, when they believe they hear something about something that's very far away or perhaps I'm just telling you, that's what the thought process is. Uh, personally, for me, if it was my case and I was in charge, I'd say, go out there, check it out, collect it. Let's see if we can figure this out. But it's a lot of it's a lot of work, and imagine how often that happens. So I'm just trying to provide an explanation as to why um, law enforcement doesn't respond all the time. No, it, it absolutely makes sense. It's it's just that I can see why people are 
upset, especially people who have been working their tails off, putting in hours and hours, countless hours of blood, sweat, and tears searching for this young man, right? And then they do find something and then suddenly they're going, oh my gosh, this could be something. This could be a break in the case. See what I did there? Could be a break <laughs> in the case. And all of a sudden, law enforcement doesn't show up, right? Or they, when they do show up, they, they just kind of, you know, they, they don't bag it and tag it. They just kind of like, eh, yeah, pff, and they just kind of dump it. They throw it back on the ground like it's trash, uh, you know. Yeah, people were blaming and still do accuse the parents of Michael Vaughan. Still do, even though law enforcement has stood there and said that the mother and the father of Michael Vaughan have been cleared. They have nothing to do with it. And he are the four suspects we are looking at. They put pictures up of these four suspects. They put their names out there. But people still today will tell us, I think the parents had something to do with it. You don't hear the father talking. For Christ's sake, the father was the one in charge of the child. Don't you think he's feeling bad enough as it is that while in his care, his little boy is wandered out on the front of the house instead of staying in the backyard. He's gone out the front. Don't you think by making, because he's making that one phone call to order pizza or something, that while he's on that phone call, his little boy is wounded out the front. Right? Don't you think he feels bad enough? Already. Without people saying, I think they've done it. But they still do. And it is wrong because they have got four suspects and they are building a case. Believe me, they are. Right, how much more have we got of this? People are still feeling disheartened with that kind of alleged reaction, okay? Um, because I, I haven't seen it personally. I've, I've not been there with my own eyes, a witness to this type of treatment. But that's what I've been hearing uh, mm -hmm. about the treatment out here in these streets, um, especially within this search. And that, um, so, you know, thank you so much for breaking that down. I really do appreciate it. We got a couple more. Samantha uh, Pascal, uh, does our guest believe that if the FBI is taking over the case, that they will bring in Chris and Katie for questioning again, for, uh, for questioning again, for questioning again? Yeah. You know, will, you know, if, if they take over, will Chris Proudfoot and Katie Proudfoot be back in the interrogation room questioned all over again? Yeah, good question, but I don't want to, is it Samantha? I don't Samantha. want to dishearten uh, Samantha, but I don't believe it's going to be taken over. But say there was information, like I mentioned, a kidnapping or something across state lines and combine that with and uh, local law enforcement, TBI, asked the FBI to uh, take the lead, then yes. I mean, the Bureau is going to, in a lot of ways, start all over. They're going to look at everything all over again. You have to do that. You have to conduct your own investigation. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so that would be a, a affirmative. I guess affirmative. that would be affirmative. See, that's a lot FBI. of jabbering to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. You good? No, I'm just saying. You know, that, that I was just saying affirmative. You know, like FBI. You know, affirmative. Ten, ten, four. Ten uh, four. What, I still use my ten codes all the time. Oh, uh, really? What's your twenty and all that? <laughs> what's your you twenty? <laughs> you, you've probably seen it. I guarantee in our DMs. When I respond affirmatively, I write 10 4. I do it with everything. 10 4. It's, 10 4. Hey, it's all good. You know what I mean? Uh, some things you just can't shake, right? Habits um, are hard to break. S Dubs just asked this. Uh, thank you so much, S Dubs. Uh, Julia Valenti, dog handler, needs to know if she's been t chatting with you on X. So uh, she's just asking, I guess, to oh. confirm. Oh, okay. So uh, Julia, there, no. there is a dog, a dog handler that I very much want to intersect with uh, that I've been kind of going back and forth on X. Perhaps that's Julia. Questions of anyone else of theirs. Uh, I'm talking about the geofence information. Once you start mm -hmm. looking at at those, you know, numbers, and there's so much more to do. Once you establish a number, then you have to look at what was the exact time frame, and then you have to see what phones contact that phone. There is a lot to do, and these carriers, unfortunately, don't always answer lickety split, even though it's just a pressing of a button. So right. there's a lot. That hopefully, and and I would believe because I have faith in the blue, for the most part, I really hope that these are these items are being done. One other question. I'm sorry, <laughs> I lied. I got another question. Uh, when it comes to footage, 
the footage that they allegedly already have, I mean, they only showed, from what Seth has said, they only showed him proof of life, which was the video of Sebastian walking out of Texas Roadhouse, getting in a car, and driving off. Now, if there is street cam footage, et cetera, and I'm sure they have, you know, gigabytes, you know, hard drives filled with just security cameras all over the place. Why haven't they just shown everything to the families in general that, that are just wanting to see the footage that they have so far? Well, I'm curious as to what they actually have because they have the starting point. Um, but again, I, I can't tell you how many times you'll go, go to a quick trip or, you know, whatever and look for their, st and they say, oh, sorry, it recorded over. Or right. sorry, you know, we didn't have it plugged in. I mean, it's mind boggling. But uh, oftentimes the video camera doesn't work, whatever it might be. Um, so I'm curious because we, they have that starting point. It's in a populated area. There should be so much potential video footage. And then you have to leapfrog it. Just think of all the. And then what happened if she didn't go from point A to point B, which I think she said she didn't. There were yeah. other stops in there. So there's a lot for them to go through. There's a lot for them to try to get their hands on. And remember, you have to use subpoenas and search warrants to get this information. And that's a whole nother judicial process because yeah. everything's going to be called into question, right? Chain of custody, uh, you know, uh, verification that that's authentic. We call it authentic uh, evidence that's, that we know the origin. So there's a lot to do behind the scenes. So I really, truly believe we're way premature to ever think this is going to go cold at this point. And a lot's being done. So when you say way premature that this is going to go cold. I, and I, honestly, I, I think that's great to hear that it's really early early to say or predict it going cold. But you understand that we've been 80 days in this mug. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we've been 80 days in this thing. So I, I'm wondering. John, oh, yeah. yeah, out there, all rigged out in hazmat clothing, day after day after day. And it's not just a grid search this, this way. It's a grid search this way. Because landfills run vertical as well as horizontal. It's painstaking. Mm. There's no way they could have done that landfill search, even if that dump truck driver thought he remembered, or the driver, sorry, the trash driver thought he remembered. It It was, it's still very difficult by the time they got out there to do a proper search, in my opinion. But the- So she says the fact that they only spent two days, well, they didn't even spend two days. They spent one day doing that search. Right? On that uh, landfill. Right? Uh, I always put the uh, link in the descriptions on all these videos, Ellie. Always. And his um, cash app as well. But she said no way could they have done a full and full search of that landfill in one day. They couldn't have. And I agree, there's no way they could have done a proper search in one day. Right, I think the petition is going along the bottom now, the link. Right, but hold on, I'll see if I can get it up here. Um... Yeah. Um. Oh. Right. I'll keep. I'll put the link in the description. Okay. Right. Let me get to brand. Oh no, comments. Here's the link. Okay. Uh, how much more? So that was the main piece I wanted you to see as well about the... Um, I'm not going to watch anymore because even though it's nearly finished now anyway. So, but that was my problem. That was only there for one day. We thought it was going to be there for two days, but it was only there for one day. How can you do a proper search of a landfill in one day? Can't be done. Right. 
Uh, oh God, can't hit the wrong banger again. Not this one. Fact it. Got the one going along with the bottom. It can't be done. So I don't know. And why haven't they searched the other landfills? I know they've got to get warrants, but they need. Yeah, the two landfill situation is up. There are so many questions and confusion, especially with fire. Shows me criminal investigation have. Had to have warrant. Well, actually, could you get a warrant from the judge just for an investigation? Is you got to have um, what what is it? Um, to get a warrant, you've got to have more. Oh, I can't think of the word you can have. Right, but you've got to have a good reason. For the judge to sign it. No, you don't have to donate. Just sign it and share it. That's it. Probable cause. They have to have probable cause. Well, I'm sorry, there's several landfills around there. Right? They need to get all these landfills. Because they said... I know for a fact, I did do some research on that Kentucky, right? And it said it was uh, rubble and wood and met all that sort of stuff that you get from a construction site, right? That went to the Kentucky, right? Now, it's also been said that the landfill behind the second generation construction company, right, is like a, a stopover. So it's like when they get, when their trucks are full, if their trucks are too full, they go there, jump it all there, and then carry on with their round, whatever. That's how I figured it out. And then it gets picked up again by Another uh, van, lorry, and get took to the next landfill, the proper landfill. So it's only like a holding bay. Yeah, well, I'm old. I'm old. I'm definitely old. Well, too old. So it's like a holding bay that plays behind the second generation. Seth said it's like a holding bag. It's not somewhere where they leave it and just get on. Aztec, I'm 70. Oh, you, you're 70, Ellie, today. Happy birthday. Thank you, Necro. Necro. Happy birthday to Ellie. Well, I was looking forward to my 40th. I was, I didn't even mind my 50th. Well, happy birthday, sweetheart. Happy birthday to you. Right? But I am dreading my 60th. Don't know why I was looking. I couldn't wait. It's like I was counting the years down for my 40th because I knew by then my son was old enough to look after my daughter. I'd be able to go out without having to worry about getting a babysitter and all that lot. But then 50 was come along. I thought, yeah, I don't mind 50. Yeah, everyone can go and take a hike now. Right? But 60 if I'm like... She does, doesn't she? She sounds younger in chat. Big 7 -0. Well, I'm way to go, Ellie. Way to go. But I'm dreading my... I'm two years off my 60th. I'm dreading my 60th. 
เอาเวลามสบัตรเมื่อไหร่ก็จะใช้ใครที่ใช้ใครมาเพราะว่าฉันไม่รู้ว่าฉันต้องใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ยาไปสักกี่ปีของการใช้ Total all clear, right? But it doesn't mean it won't come back. It couldn't come back. So I'm living with that every day. That thought is in my head every day. That this could come back. So I'll just take each day as it comes. So, but I'm we're going to leave that video there because. To be honest, I think she leaves after that. Shortly after that, she finishes. She has to go and pick a child up from school. But I just found it interesting what she said about the landfill. Right? I do. Don't worry about sixty. It was all downhill after fifty. <laughs> I don't know. I I can't sort of like my fortieth and my fifty, and especially my fiftieth, because it's like you know what, everyone can take a hike now because I don't care what I say. <clears throat> If you don't like it, f off. You know what I mean? That was my attitude when I hit fifty. I don't care what anyone. What if you don't like what I say? There's the door. Walk out of it. Just don't let it hit you on the way out. Right. And um, that's how I've been for the last eight years. Like I don't give a hoot no more. Yes, I am being positive, Ellie. I am. And I've had two years clear. Well, I'm coming up to my second year clear. You know what I mean? So. And so seventies and you're fifty. Oh, so fifties and you thirty? That's probably why I feel so young at the moment. But some guys, I feel so old. I do. My, it's like someone said to me years and years and, when I was younger. When I was younger, don't get old. Don't get old. It's no, it's no. And I thought, well, how can I not get old unless I plan myself to go get on a ride before I hit a certain age, which I'm not going to do. So I'm going to get old. Right, I just think it can't be that bad. It can't be that bad, surely. Yes, it is. The only good thing about being old is you can say what you want without giving a hoot. That's the only good thing about getting old. Is you can absolutely like if you don't like something, someone says something. You can absolutely sit there and say, "You know what? I totally disagree. I totally don't like what you just said." And if they start to argue, say, "Well, this is my opinion. And if you don't like it, f off." Because that's what you use. It's my opinion. I don't like what you just said. That's my opinion. <laughs> I've got two mirrors. No, three mirrors. One in the bathroom, which is only a small one. One in my bedroom, which is quite a big one, it's like body length sort of thing. You don't get my legs. You just get my head down to my top of my legs sort of thing. And then I've got a big, biggish mirror in my living room, which weighs a ton. And I've got to get it off the wall sooner or later because I want to paint that wall. But I have to have a big, heavy bolt put in the wall to have it secured on the wall because it's that heavy. I'm fifty, but people seem to think I'm my son's wife. <laughs> They are twenty-two. <laughs> I think more people need glasses because I'm I'm tired. <laughs> you have good genes.
Yes, Necro, you have good genes. Right, well, I'd love to go back to my hometown, Birmingham, just to see if anyone recognises me. Right? Without opening my mouth, just to see if anyone recognised me. Right, now, I think it was my sister's, yeah, it would have been my sister's 60th birthday party. And my mum's neighbour, well, both my mum's neighbours were sitting on these two tables, and we sat on the table next to them. Right, so there's me and my husband and my two kids, and we're sitting at this table. Now, when I'm at a party, I'm very social. I go around and say hello to people. I don't sit at the table. I, I like to mingle. Right? So I've said, I'm just going up. I'm just going to say hello to someone over there. And my husband's going, OK. So I've got up and I'm saying hello to people and everything. And my one neighbour said to her husband, Right? I don't see Angela here. And he's gone, she's here. Say, there she is over there. No. Yeah, that's her. So anyway, I've made my way round and I'm coming back and I'm saying hello to him. And she said, you don't age. And you know what? I said, I love you. I think... How old would I be then if my sister was 60? I've got to be, what, 40-something, 42, 41, 42, something like that. 40, either 40 or 42, something like that. And I said, oh, I love you, Joan. I said, that's the best compliment I could have had. And then I was at another party. And I was there again because my mum always invited both my neighbours to come to these parties. And my neighbour said, you just don't age, do you? And I'd love to go back now and say, do you think I've aged now? Yeah. Well, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I've never done is used a tanning bed. I've never used any tanning bibs. Um, if I do go out in the sun, I do get, and I'm out there for a while, I can get burnt very easily now. Where before, I never used to get burnt. I'd go brown very quickly, but never got burnt. Now, I'm finding I do burn. That, but that's just my skin getting old. Ellie, exactly what do you tie in your, this conversation could go down real fast. <laughs> I do age is a state of mind. Yes. <coughs> oh, as I say, as old as a man you're, uh, you're free, uh, old as a man you're sitting by, which is no one. So, I've got two boys, two boy cats, that's three years old, so they were all sitting by me somewhere. I don't know where they are at the moment. Oh, one's right behind me. It's sitting behind. The one cat is sitting behind the living room door, which means the other cat is the other side of the door waiting to come in. My other cat will come in and this cat is going to jump out on him. Aren't you? <coughs> <coughs> but no, I'm... <laughs> Because I like trading my 60th. Boom. Hey up. As I say to anyone else, if you don't like it, you know what you can do. <laughs> but I remember my 50th because my son and daughter took me out for drinks. And we'd only just moved to this area in Scotland, this place in Scotland. We hadn't been there long. We'd been there, what, about... Mm, about six to eight months, so we didn't really know the place because I was working, but we didn't go out. We never went out to the pubs or anything, right, because I was just a home bird. But then it was only when my daughter got a job at this pub 
at this one pub that I f we started going to this pub on the weekends. I couldn't do it now though. I don't want to retain the christening. Don't want to because I haven't seen them in 30 years so they will not recognise me. Oh, you should go. It's a christening, it's a baby. Yeah, SG, I feel the same. I feel like people say if you could go back, what age would you go back to? Now, when I was 30, I used to say I was happy at the age of 23, 22, 23, round that way. Now I'm 58, if I was to go back, I'd like to go back to when I was 30. You know what I mean? I'd like to go back to when I was 30, when my kids were still... My son would have been six and my daughter would have been four. And I enjoyed those years, I really did. It's like parents just say, oh God, we've got the summer holidays coming on. We've got the kids at home for six weeks. Oh my God. You know what? I loved having my children at home. I loved every minute that we had at home. You know what I mean? Even if we didn't go away that year because my husband was working and he couldn't get the time off during the six weeks, I went out, if not every day, at least two or three times that week, we went out somewhere with the kids to a like a, a park where they had the animals, like a sort of thing, and other big parks. I will not relive that marriage through all those years, but I'd love to relive those years with my children. Yes, that would be me. I'd love to live those years with my children again. Ellie, you could send an actress to be in your place. <laughs> <coughs> but now you see, I'm just reliving those years through my grandchildren. You know what I mean? Because I've got two grandsons who were both six, who were coming up to seven. My one grandson will be seven next month. And my other grandson will be seven in the October. And then in the January of next year, my granddaughter will be four. Wow, good for you. I don't know if I want to live, relive my marriage again. I really doesn't, don't. Don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? But. I do miss my kids at that age. I wish I, if I could have just frozen time when I was 30, when my kids were like six and four, and just kept them at that age forever. I would. Because I think the ages of six and four are great because... At six years, uh, they're coming into their own person. They're talking more. They're, they're telling you what they want more, what they like to see and what they like to do. And at the age of four, three and four, they're still learning. But, you know... That's why one weekend I won't be on at all because in July because I go down to my daughter's on the Friday and his birthday is actually the week before I go down. But she's not having his party till the week after his birthday because she doesn't want to confuse him by having his but because I think his birthday falls on a week day in the week. So she doesn't want his birthday party before his birthday because they'll be thinking, well, it's not my birthday, so why am I having a party? So if she has the party after, he'll have his birthday where he'll get his gifts off his mum and dad and off his other grand who live down there. 
and then he's got his party to look forward to. So he can then go and invite his friends from school. So like he's got something to talk about with his friends at school about this party he's going to have. So he's not going to get confused. Well, I'm having my party now, but my, it's not my birthday. It doesn't make sense. So she's having a party after his birthday. I had two bad ones before. I didn't pick one. My friends and family picked this husband for me. Got four great kids. Way to go. All three of my sons are April babies. My daughter's an April baby and my son is a January baby. But my son's wife is also... Her birthday's in January, literally two days after my son's birthday. So I have two birth three birthdays in January. That's my granddaughter's, who was born on the 1st of January. And on the year she was born, which was which year? She's three now. So she's born in 21. She was the first baby born in Scotland. In 2021. I do have a good life with my grandkids and children. I love them all. I wouldn't change them for a thing. But like someone said to me, would you ever get married again? I said, no. No. Been there. Had the t-shirt, not happening again. And they go, why? And I pick up one item in my house, and that is the TV controls. I say, see these controls? And they go, yeah. I say, they are mine. I control what I watch. There's no arguing. It's my controls, and only what I want to watch Get to put on that TV. So I'm quite happy being on my own. But people used to say to me, I bet you have another one after I had my daughter. My mum knew I wouldn't have another one. Knew it. Even when they was driving home after I gave birth to my daughter and they, I was going up to the ward and my mum and dad was taking my husband and my son home. My son, my husband, my mum said, I'm glad she's had a little girl. And my husband turned around and said, oh, I'm sure she'll have another one. Oh, no, she'll have another one. My mum said, no, she won't. She won't have no more. She's got a boy, she's got a girl. She won't have no more. Oh, she will. She'll have another one. No, I think my husband will give life to another one. Uh -huh. And my husband said, believe me, when my daughter sent it, said in that hospital after she gave birth and found out it was a little girl, what did she say? You know what I said? Because I didn't find out if I was having a girl with D. I could have, but I didn't want them. I like that surprise. When I found out it was a little girl, I went, thank God no more. That's what I said after I gave birth to Dee, my daughter. Thank God, no more. And I told my mum this, you see, after, when they come in the room afterwards. And so when my husband said, oh, she'll have another one, my mum said, in your dreams, maybe. In your dreams. But I tell you now, I know my daughter, and when she said, no more, she means it. And I didn't. My firstborn was born on my birthday, and my wife was singing happy birthday as he was being delivered. Oh, God. We have two rooms with our own TVs. Now, oh, guys, like. <laughs> I want it to be the crazy lady in the little woods that no one physics except my children. I want to be that. 
I've all said I'm going to go out of this world kicking and screaming like I came into this world kicking and screaming. I'm going out the same way. Hey, Dean Necro, I'd love to see you two on panel together. <laughs> Maybe one night. One night you could have Necro up here on panel. But, no, um, but my husband was saying, oh, she'll have, a, she'll have another one. My husband said, my mum said, in your dreams. In your dreams, maybe. Because when my daughter says something, she's adamant. She's not having no more. And I was. I got a little girl. I got my little boy. What else was I going to get different? I could only have another little girl or another little boy. And that's what my sister said. She had a little boy and then a little girl. And she didn't have no more. She said, what else was I going to get different? I wasn't going to get anything different. So why have more? And to be honest with you, I think if I'd have had a third one, my daughter would have been kicking up how. I don't think my daughter would have liked to have a of a brother or another sister. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm going to have to go because it's three and a half hours gone. So I've got to go, take my medication. And then get to bed. So happy birthday anyway to you. Hope you have a lovely day. Hope you get spoiled early. Hope you've been spoiled. So and I'll I'm not sure if I'll be on tomorrow night. I'll set something up for tomorrow night, but it all depends on my grandson because I've got my grandson tomorrow night and Saturday night. And on Saturday night, I've got my granddaughter. She's not so bad. She goes to bed about 7.30, 8pm. She's there for the night. She's there till the morning. My grandson is a different thing altogether. So, I might be on tomorrow night. I might not. But I definitely won't be on Saturday. Enjoy your day, enjoy your evening, and I'll see you all tomorrow night, hopefully. Till then, thank you all for being here. I really do appreciate you. Don't forget to give this like. If you've liked what you've heard, give us a like. And I'll see you all, hopefully, tomorrow night. Good night.